Hello, and welcome to Season 8, Episode 8 of the Cartridge Club's Game of the Month podcast, where we bring together members of the Cartridge Club community to discuss our community playthrough. If you're new to the club or are interested in participating in future months for games like ActRaiser and Cuphead, please join our community Discord, our forums at cartridgeclub.org, or follow us on Twitter, at cartridgeclubna. We love to see the hashtag Cartridge Club used whenever you talk about one of the games we've selected. I'm Melissa, Mrs. Q-Dog, here with my husband, Eric, the Mighty Q-Dog. And on behalf of our rotating pool of hosts, Josh, Church, Ryan, and Musty Hobbit, I'd like to thank you for tuning in. Additionally, on behalf of the entire Cartridge Club community, I'd like to give a huge shout out to our Patreon club backers. Joel Boyce, Kevin from Buried on Mars, Base Guy, Dean Lasagna from Round 2 Gaming, and Caleb J. Ross. Thank you all so, so very much. It's April, and to go with the warm winds of spring, we are playing The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker. Joining me to talk about the game is Eric. Hello. Josh. Hello. Dean. Hey guys, thanks for having me. And John. Hi everybody, how's it going? Good, good, good. Thank you all for being here. I'm very excited. This um, was my very first introduction to a Zelda game. And uh, I played it several years ago. And I loved every moment of it. <laughs> so uh, when uh, the club decided to play it for their game of the month, uh, naturally, I said that we would host it. <laughs> uh -huh. So... Um, Let's talk, let's talk about uh, whether you guys have played this before and maybe which version you played. I played the Wii U HD version. Um, I think I don't even know why we chose that. I guess just because it was newer and I was like, I'll play the new one. Yeah. So, yeah. but Eric, what did you what did you play? Yeah, so I played I played the Wii U version too and we actually have it for the GameCube. Mm -hmm. We bought it when it was released uh, and I probably opened it at the time, checked the disc and then sat on it, and then uh, I bought the HD remake for the Wii U, mm -hmm. sat on that, and then I think we got the digital copy for free when we bought, I looked it up, when we bought Mario Kart, they were doing some kind of promotion, and you could get the digital copy for free. So that's probably why, I'm like, well, look, it's already on the Wii U, we yeah. downloaded it, you can just play it. Yeah. And so I had heard, uh, I love HD, it's a gorgeous game, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about that, but I played the Wii U version HD also. Mm hmm uh, Dean, what did you play? Yeah, yeah, this is my first time with The Wind Waker. Um, you know, I, I never really considered myself like a diehard Zelda fan. I still don't. I played the original two on the NES and I love them, but it really wasn't until, um, I guess September 2013, like when the Cartridge Club started, our first game was A Link to the Past. And that was my first time really giving that game a go. Um, mm -hmm. and same with like Majora's Mask and, and, whatever mm -hmm. episode season three mm -hmm. um, i played ocarina on the 64 and i played breath of the wild just because of the accolades it was getting yeah oh sure but, you know things like uh twilight princess or, or wind waker or skyward sword like i, I never uh experienced those so I, I i loved the idea of doing it and and i'm really glad um i've i finally played it now i, I have sort of a tendency to play things in order and I think the Wind Waker was sort of the, the next gate on that journey. I think this will open the door to Twilight Princess and to Skyward Sword and some of those other maybe DS or, or GBA experiences. But I played it on the GameCube. Oh, I, I know. Good. Yeah. Yeah. good. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I've, I kind of felt bad for, you know, missing out on a game for so long and, and hearing the, the praise it was getting, you know, throughout high school and, and beyond. Um, I, I just wanted to try to re-experience some of that magic. And I know the HD version improves on a lot of things, but I had it for the GameCube. I don't give it enough love. So I just tried it on there and I'm, I'm glad I tried it. Yeah. Good. I wanted, we definitely want to talk about yes, your experience on the GameCube versus Wii U. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, John, what about you? So I played the HD version for this particular playthrough. Uh, this would be my third time total beating Wind Waker. Um, wow. Yeah, I've uh, played a lot of the Zelda games. There's been a few gaps in my experience, which would be a big one being Ocarina of Time. I haven't played that one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a couple of the more modern ones, like Link Between Worlds um, and some of the DS titles. Uh, but overall, I've played and beaten 
the vast majority of the uh, the franchise, and I love it to death. So I'm super excited. Uh, this would be the first time I've beaten the HD version, though. I played okay. both two on GameCube previously. Oh, so you've, okay. you've experienced both. Nice. That's okay. good, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, and Josh, what about you? Uh, so I played on the Wii U. Um, I Once I got the Wii U version of uh, Wind Waker, I got rid of my GameCube copy. So I, that could be sacrilege <laughs> for some people. Um, but I did have... Um, I, like Dean, like to play things in order. So I wanted to to do that as much as possible. So I played uh, the one, two, uh, Link to the Past, and then I played Breath of the Wild when it came out. And I went back to play Ocarina, but I didn't get super far. I wasn't really feeling it. Uh, and I, I did want to jump into Wind Waker at some point. And so this this month really gave me an excuse to, to jump into that and, and finish it up. Mm, good. Okay. okay. Now, hang on. So I want to make sure, because, uh, John, you mentioned you'd played this three times before, but everybody mm-hmm. else... This was our first time, is mm-hmm. that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. time through for everybody else. Yep. Yes. Okay. And I had another <laughs> question, but I've already forgotten what it was. So. Oh. <laughs> well, you you can ask it any time. If I remember what it was, time. I'll bring it up. <laughs> All right. So the Cartridge Club put out a poll uh, when we first started playing this at the beginning of the month. Uh, what do you name, when you play it, what do you name your character? What do you name your save file? Um, and... Me not knowing anything, I I just put my name when I played. I yeah. was like, listen. And then I was like, oh, that kind of sounds dumb now, like when they say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> I was going to say, I typically do weird names. Uh, oh, yeah. For in my playthrough here, it was Bob. Um, <laughs> oh, and wow. yeah, I, like, I just do silly names because sometimes it works out and it becomes inadvertently hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I. Uh, most of the time, no, I like to have that agency. I like to yeah. be able to have control over the name. I'm fine with people being Link, but yeah. I like to just do my own thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, what did you uh, name your character, Josh? Uh, I was lame and just said Josh. Yeah. <laughs> and see, what you're did... not alone. <laughs> yeah. What did you do, Dean? You know, I, I always do Link. Um, I'm oh, yeah. sort of a sucker for continuity and... I also don't like to delete save files if they're already on a memory card or a cart and somebody already took the name Link. So I did R2G. Just because Rams Gaming wouldn't fit. So this is the first time I've deviated, but that that sort of personality quirk outweighed my need to name him Link. Interesting. That's yeah. funny. That's like the first thing I do is wipe out old memory cards. Because <laughs> I don't want to confuse my saves. And, I couldn't that, do I it. That hurts. Game. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I also that's someone's hard work. I know. Well, yeah, they shouldn't have sold it to me. Uh, no, uh, I also named it Eric. Okay, so what we've got here, I think, is interesting. All five of us yeah. named it after ourselves, kind of. Well, well yeah. okay, John, you named it Bob, which I think is really funny. Bob, yeah. the, hero, yeah. the hero of time, the hero of the high rule is Bob. Exactly. Uh, but the poll results. The poll results said that. 67% said they named it Link, named their character Link. Yeah. Uh, and um, we actually got a couple comments. Uh, PK in the universe said that he like retweeted somebody else um, naming their character and they named it My Dude. So that, <laughs> you know, like whenever you're reading it, it's like, hey, my dude. Hey, my dude. You know, it's real like, like <laughs> that. Chill. Yeah. And then. Um, at One Wild Journey, uh, Daniel says he uses wild, unless something, you know, else feels appropriate. But it's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. That's good. Uh-huh. So uh, let's kind of talk about the story and the gameplay. Um, you, when you start the game, uh, Link is celebrating his birthday, right? And so uh, he's going about his day and, you know, he's talking to his sister and talking to the people and stuff. And then all of a sudden, a large bird drops this pirate, Captain Tetra, into the forest. And so Link, being the hero that he Eric. is, uh, goes uh, and Josh. rescues her. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, he, he goes and rescues her. But then the bird takes his sister, Errol, and it's all, you know, so sad. <laughs> so Tetra um, agrees to take Link to the Forsaken Fortress, where he can rescue his sister. 
And uh, when he does, uh, the bird shows up again and captures Link and shows him to the man in black. Yeah. Who could that be? And Did you know? This was your oh. first Zelda game. Did you know who it was? Uh, I don't remember. I mean, it's been a few years, so I don't remember. No. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's the villain. It's yes, obviously. We all right? know, right? We all know yes. who it is. So he, you know, he throws him into the sea because the a guy in black says, "Get rid of him," and then you have this special talking boat that saves you, the King <laughs> of Red Lions. That's Bobby not McBoat weird. Face. Yes, that's not yep. weird at all. That's what. If I could have named him, I would have named him that. That's yeah. Right. Why couldn't we name the boat? <laughs> Anyway, go ahead. King of Red Lions. <laughs> yes. So the he explains that that mysterious man in black is Ganon. And in order to defeat him, you need to find the hero of time's power by finding the three pearls and then eventually the master sword. And then you can defeat him. Okay. And this is your quest, if you choose, yeah. to take it on. So, yeah. So it started with your sister's kidnapping yes. and it became a quest to take over, take Ganon, over Ganon and Ganon. save the world. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk about some gameplay. Um, you know, uh, you have this vast sea to explore, yeah, yeah. right? And so you use your friend, Bodie McBoderson, or <laughs> King of the Red Lions, whatever you want to call him, uh, to go around and, um, you know, go to, there's certain islands that you have to go to, right? Mm, so, yeah. uh. What did you guys think, like, sailing-wise, you know, was that something you enjoyed, or was it kind of a pain in the butt? Um, Josh? Okay. Um, I will say that uh, the, uh, in terms of sailing, I didn't like it at first. It, it definitely took me to, like, the second half of the game before I really got into it, um, mostly because... While you're sailing around, you, there's little, I would say, uh, glowing circles in the water that you can pull up to once you have an upgrade to, uh, I don't know, deep sea treasure find or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem was that my wallet upgrade, my wallet was only capped at 1,000. So anytime I was pulling any of that stuff up, I was already capped at my 1,000. All that stuff was going to waste. And I, there wasn't really anything for me to spend my money on at the time. So I just kind of sat like set my heading and just hit sail and then i could just put the controller down and leave <laughs> and come back and i would be where i needed to be <laughs> and i just kind yeah. of ignored everything around me and i just kind of wanted to like get to where i needed to be and do what i needed to do um but l later on as you get the upgrades and you can go faster and you can uh you don't have to uh change the wind every time you want to move directions i think that's uh uh, uh an upgrade from the Wii U version, uh, where you, when you get the a faster sail, you can just point the direction you want to go and change the wind. Um, once once I had those upgrades, sailing became a lot more fun. And uh, once I got the wallet upgrade as well, also got more fun because I could actually go and do some treasure hunting and it be worthwhile. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Let's. I want to ask Dean. So yes. I know. I know John. John's eagerly, mm -hmm. he wants to talk, but I want to wait. <laughs> you played both. So, Dean, you played the GameCube version, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what was that experience? I've heard, I've heard they made fixes in the Wii U version. So, what was uh, the game? It, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. You know, no, I, I think I'll apologize in advance to, to any listeners. You know, I, I made a list of, like, the top 10 frustrations I have with the game's gameplay in the, in the Cartridge Club Discord, and, and, after talking it out with the community, like eight out of 10 items are addressed or uh, at least partially resolved in the HD version. So I think maybe a lot of this won't resonate with you guys, but sailing was just the worst. It was, <laughs> it it's such yeah. a, you know, I felt like personally that the game sort of contradicted itself the entire time. You know, it, I felt like what it was trying to do is give me a sense of sort of like freedom of exploration, like freedom of discovery, right? Uh -huh. And then it just throws like a, just a bunch of bullshit in the way, like all these weird mechanics that just slow you down or push you off course. Like you first start, like when you first get the sail for your boat 
and you sail off, you launch off. It's such a good feeling, right? Because you got the music playing like that awesome ocean theme. You're flying through the waves. Like you got the sun on your face and the wind on your back and you got seagulls flying beside you and there's fish jumping out of the water. It's like, it's a really cool feeling because up until that point, you're, you're sort of isolated on these little islands and you, you open your map, your, your, your sea chart and you've been sailing for like 10 minutes and you, your icon has only moved a couple inches and you're like, man, this world is huge. Like how many islands can I discover? I'm going to be stumbling across some like really cool power-ups that I shouldn't have stumbled across. And I was just getting really excited. Like that was a moment for me that I liken to like a Bethesda game. Like when you come out of the vault and fall out and, and the world opens up or out of the dungeon in oblivion or like when you get the high wind in final fantasy seven and suddenly you can go anywhere you want. It was, it was one of those really great feelings until you try to turn the boat. And then you're just like, are you kidding me? Like you just stop. You're, you're just sitting there in the open ocean. You can't move. I didn't know what to do. After a while, you realize you have to pull out that, that stick and, and, and play that song and change the wind so you can turn your boat. Are you kidding me? Like, and it's, it's another thing that the HD version does is it, it sort of shortens the play time of the songs every time you pull out that wand. But in the GameCube version, you don't have a quick key. You have to specifically equip it to one of your three buttons. Mm -hmm. uh, you play it. It goes like, you know, once you remember what the song is, it's like ding, 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 mm -hmm. ding, ding, ding. And it's just this like obnoxiously, sarcastically long cut scene and like the dramatic wind change. And then you can change the direction of your ship. Mm -hmm. I think that's like a really cool mechanic for like a dungeon. Like if it's like a puzzle, but that's the entire game. Yeah. Yeah. Like we don't get the, in the GameCube version, we, in the GameCube version, there wasn't the concept of a fast sail. It was wow. just, the, the entire game was just changing wind directions and you have to watch this like obnoxious cutscene every oh. single yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that is something also too, in the HD version, like you said that the wind waker that is automatically on the D pad. Yeah. It's yeah. not, it's always in, there. It's yeah. not in your like the like the three button you know like for your, your inventory items. yeah it's from your inventory so that you know they also changed it that way too so it was readily available but not in but not in the way you know you didn't have to switch it out all the time you yeah. Know? right yeah so gamecube you have three buttons you yeah. need to sail right to yeah. move you need the the cannon to shoot and you yeah. need the dredge or the the, the grapple to fish mm -hmm. things out so the, the the baton or the the wind waker is never in your inventory until you you know, have to go into your menu, attach it, play the wow. song to turn a boat, and it just seems like you know a, a, a Nintendo pedigree or like a, a caliber of game like Nintendo usually does. It just seems like a weird mechanic to throw in your way, and it, it sort of just made discovery a chore, right? Yes, that's yes. unfortunate. Yeah, that okay. is unfortunate. Now the the Wii U version also would sorry just. We're touching on the Wind Waker yeah. a little bit. The Wii U version would also have all of your songs that you needed on the gamepad. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to remember them or write them all down. Yep. Which I oh, always yeah. found very interesting. Or a lot very helpful, I should say. <laughs> yeah. Okay, John, you played both versions. Oh, yeah. You guys are all right. Um, <laughs> the... The Wii U version is a million times easier. Sailing is a joy, and it's it's not really a, a difficulty, even when having to change the wind to to you know move around more fluidly because it's up on the D pad at all times, so you don't have to worry yeah. about that, which is nice. And also, when doing the songs, like what Josh said, you have the songs laid out to you. But also, what Dean was complaining about these long cutscenes, those aren't there in the Wii U version. You do the song. Yeah. And that's it. And then just wind change, go. It doesn't replay what you did. It doesn't have this dramatic thing. It just quickly and just moves through. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the Wii U version definitely streamlines everything and makes it simple. When you get that fast sail, it's amazing. It's the greatest thing ever. Like, yeah. when you're on you know, a mission, you just get to go. You just get to not have to worry about anything. Mm -hmm. um, but my experience on the GameCube version, though, there's nothing more frustrating than having to pause the game 
and switch items. Like nothing is more frustrating. Yeah. It's a it's a difficulty in everything in a game like Super Metroid when you have to pause to reference the map. Those things break up that gameplay and make it incredibly uh, monotonous, very tedious. Uh, even in a situation where the actual action, the things that are happening in the game aren't tedious, but when you have to stop and pause, it becomes a problem. Yeah. And uh, but Wind Waker HD fixes so many things. It doesn't fix everything, but it fixed so many problems. It was so nice. And it's fun to just sail, especially because I stream. And so it's, it's a nice time to talk to chat. Like, it's a nice time to like, hey, let's go do that. You know, let's go talk to everybody. Oh, that's um, true, yeah. yeah. And it's nice to also just kind of relax and enjoy the ride. You know, there's something to kind of reflect on. You're, you're very reflective in those moments. Yeah. I enjoyed it a lot. It's it's great. It's fantastic. Yeah. 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 I can't imagine having to pause. I mean, on the Wii U, I was constantly. Maybe we'll get into this dragging yes. items around. Dragging but, items, uh, yes. Dragging items was a was that was actually almost a fun thing in itself. But I enjoyed the sailing. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, like you said. I reflected. I could kind of set my course, hit the A button, set the sail, and. Uh, <laughs> can we talk? Well, can we talk about? Well, I'm gonna get into this. Can we talk about how? You yeah you set your sail and put the controller down and then you'd look at your notes and run into the mines and then run into the mines. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there's only there's only mines and so the the ocean there's there's I expected it to be like based on what I had heard over the past twenty years yeah. like empty yeah and it's not there's there's always kind of stuff to do there's right. platforms there's those ring treasures mm -hmm. they threw there's mines enemies, there's enemies. some enemies. Mm -hmm. um, they had those barrels with the rupees that you could like. Yeah. Go oh, yeah. And that's the other thing. There's these little barrels that you can kind of go through this obstacle course and get some money. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Was that yeah. it? Yeah. I ran yeah, into so the he... mines. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I'm, and I had trouble with the controls, which are I'm not even going to talk about because apparently it's even harder on the GameCube version. But, uh, but um, yeah, yeah, I thought it was. Uh, I I think Dean, um, you know, if you were to try the the HD version at some point, you might find that the sailing is actually kind of enjoyable because it does give you a time to kind of reflect and look. You know, it's it's such like a fundamental part of the game that that yeah. alone, like those fixes alone, make mm -hmm. me want to play the same yeah. game with with that, uh, yeah. you know, quality of life improvement right. because I'm that really, would be fun. Yeah. I'm really surprised to hear that the GameCube version was that broken. Uh, go ahead, Dean. Sorry. No, that was that was it. I mean, it's 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 it was such a great feeling to begin with, and and the uh, the potential was there without that mechanic or with some quality of life improvements that I think playing the HD version would just would capture that uh, mm -hmm. joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be fun to try. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Now you did get the warp song right later. That's still I in the cube version, right? Yeah. 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 There is, you can warp to certain tiles. Yeah. But yeah. even then I would find myself warping to, uh, tiles or, or squares on your C chart that were farther away from my destination just because the wind was pointed in a convenient direction. Yeah, so right. I, I okay. would transport like two two squares east because mm -hmm. my I didn't want to re-equip everything and play the song and watch the song and then have to mess around with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Um, so let's talk about some of the islands too that we uh, went to the I guess the ones that are part of the story, right? You know, there's the, like we said, the map is pretty big and there are random things you can do and explore. Uh, but there are some islands that you have to uh, go to, to progress the story. Yeah. Were any of these islands, like, do you have a favorite island uh, that you went on? Uh, John, you want to tell us? Oh man. I mean, outside of Windfall Island, which is fantastic. Uh, I love the Cabana. They, that was such a joy. Oh the, yeah, the grumpy uh, servant door, you know, and like these little cardboard cutouts where he stands. Yeah, um, that's always a really great place. It was a really fun place to explore. That stood out as being like a what? What is this? <laughs> like what? What? Um, and the only other place I enjoyed the little like um those mini game like uh tiles where there's just a, a mini game a race or doing the um the the leaf uh gliding uh -huh. like mini games um. And oh, also, yeah. uh, there's just there was a lot of really cool stuff to do. Again, when you when you talk about like oh the game is empty and open, 
uh, just water. It's like there seems to be so much depending on what you like to do, you know. Um, so there's some people who very much enjoy like doing the treasure hunting and like lining it up right and getting it all going. Other people love the mini games. Other people like the fights. You know, I enjoyed the crazy monsters that you'd encounter. Uh-huh. But uh, but for the uh, islands themselves, my favorite is definitely the cabana. I think that's just such a silly <laughs> idea. Yeah. Did you do the puzzles at the cabana? There were a lot of them. Well, there's the one, the sliding tile puzzle. Absolutely yeah. not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't do sliding tile puzzles. Like I'm yeah. a person who loves adventure games and like logic puzzles, but the moment it throws a sliding puzzle, I'm like, nope, not doing it. I'm done. All right. And and when you do those puzzles, all you're getting is money. Yeah. And yeah, I did a few. And kind yeah. of like by that time, you're like, I've got. I don't need it. Like, yep. like my purse is full. There, there was like ten minutes in the game where I thought you needed money. Yeah. Like at the beginning, I had the same experience as Josh. I, my wallet was full. I got the bigger wallet. Yeah. And then I, I don't even remember what I bought. A few things, I guess, bombs or something you could buy. Yeah. And then it was full the rest of the time. Yeah. Anyway, okay. What else? What other uh, islands? Josh, awesome. you want to tell us about the islands? Um, Any islands that stood out? I've- Favorite island, I think, just more of a, of a comedy standpoint, was the uh, the Deku Leaf race, uh, where you have humans dressed up like uh, the Rito uh, bird people. And so it's not it's not the actual bird people; it's people dressed up like bird people. <laughs> and I just found that so funny. And I, every time I saw them, it just made me laugh. Did I miss so. that? I did. Okay, I don't remember <laughs> that at all. I missed it's that like, entirely. It's, okay, go ahead. It's like, Sorry. Two squares yeah. uh, east of uh, Dragon Roost Island. Yep. You did it. I think, well, Eric did it at the end. And so I think you were kind of like. Oh, no, no. The fl- the flying one? Yes, the yeah. Flying. Oh, I thought he was talking about like a foot race where people were dressed up. No, no, no. I, I got yeah. it. Yeah, no, I did that. Yeah, I tried it a couple times, but that's the one where you have to fall into the vents. Yep. That's yeah. beyond my skill. Yeah, <laughs> I got the whole thing. I knew. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta have more magic, right? Yeah, and I yeah. gotta do this, but then I gotta aim into these things just right. The wind. I got tunnel. close. You, I got close, but I never. You got only it. have to hit the second wind tunnel. Yeah. Once okay. after that, you can skip the rest. You don't have enough magic to go all the way. I goofed it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Dean, you want to tell us about any islands that stood out to you? Yeah, I like the the you know, inhabited islands like, like Windfall Island. Like I I was back at Outstead Island all the time. I was getting, Mm. you know, grandma's potion. I was abusing that old man in the the boathouse. We're just whacking him with, with a 500 times you have to hit him with a sword. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, did you actually do it? Did you actually get him 500 times? Yeah, I got him 500 times. Yeah. Yeah. I I gave up. You get a heart (laughs) piece, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, I like those. I like the little kids on, I think it's Windfall Island. Those little like, that little oh, rat pack of, of kids that like circle you, yeah. yeah. No, that, oh, oh yeah, uh, yeah, the killer bees, yeah, the killer bees, yeah. And he like struts. And str- I don't know. I thought the animations were were really cool. We'll get into that in the graphics, but um, I, I, I like the character inhabited islands. I don't know. I, I just kind of felt, and I don't know if it's different in the HD version, but you know, I would visit an island early on, thinking I'm discovering something, and I would find that okay, it's it's gated because I need an item, which is you know standard Zelda trope. I need. The iron yeah. boots. I need. I need something, but there was no way for me to like notate that on my map. And even when I discovered an island, it, it wouldn't really like show on my sea map. I had to feed a fish, and mm-hmm. you know you have to like yeah. buy bait from Beetle. But mm-hmm. then there's like an inventory management component where I can only carry like so much bait in my bag. And I don't know. Again, it just sort of seemed counterintuitive to the concept of discovery. Like I've discovered an island. I know I need to come back to it when I have this item. Let me write it down somewhere. And I felt like maybe because Nintendo Power did the guide for it, like they really wanted you to buy a strategy guide or, or, or something, because I really feel like um, th- this game, you either had to map it out on a piece of paper or, you know, you you, you had to wait till the end of the game before you even tried because you were just disappointed island after island after island after island early game because you didn't have any of the items. So it sort of discouraged you from trying to, discover anything well i mean you kind of felt like that too right eric like you'd yeah. especially like when you got some of the charts right like you got a chart that said where all the heart pieces were but it that didn't, was near to the end yeah but i'm mean, just saying like it didn't tell you oh well you've already gotten there's like no interface that would say well you've already gotten these so yeah. if you weren't writing it down yeah so you're exploring again 
there was a part, and we haven't really gotten to this, but there's there's a part in the game where there, it's kind of like you kind of complete the first, maybe the first third of the game, and and you open up this thing. And at that point, I took the opportunity, and maybe this is the segue into the next yeah. section. I took the opportunity to explore the map, and I actually because maybe my wallet was only at a thousand at this point, yeah. and I'm like, I keep getting all this money. Maybe I'll just go and buy all this bait. And I'll just systematically go through and talk to every fish. And I did that. And I, I probably spent a few hours and I just kind of spent a week doing that. And I put it all in. I mean, Dean, you said, where did I, I, have, I put it in my phone. I have this big giant note in my phone with all the islands listed and all the things that I needed to do. And to be honest with you, I probably spent about a third of my time in the game typing into my phone. <laughs> but um, I, I didn't. It didn't bother me that that part of the game. It was maybe laborious or tedious, but I thought it was kind of fun. I I went and I found each fish and I opened up the map, and so I had opened up the entire map um, and got all their hints and tried to make good notes. And so um, and I tried to keep notes of what I was going to have to go back to, and mm -hmm. I forgot. Right? I, I made mistakes. Yeah, because there was this one. I was like, you can go back to this other island, and you're and like, I, which island? Which I, I it's like, not in my notes. Oh, I don't want to tell you. You know, yeah. I was I was trying <laughs> so, not to tell you exactly what. Yeah. So. I don't know. What was my point? Um, just, did anybody, was, did you guys do the fish? Did you open up the island or the island? When did mm -hmm. you open up your map? I love the fish. Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> I, I think it's a really interesting character. I very much enjoyed talking to him and he gave little like, you know, hints and, and allusions to other things. Mm -hmm. um, and also it fed into the economy of the game. Like you said, like you were running out, you had so much money you didn't know what to do with. You're like, well, I'll buy bait then and, and go fill that out. You're also accruing points with Beetle then, the merchant. And it's oh, leveling yeah. up, you know, that sort of thing, your membership card. And uh, so it all kind of fed into the economy of the game and it incentivized you to explore more um but i do think that uh dean was entirely right on there should have been a way to add notes even like just a symbol of the item that you might want to yeah. use to like sticker like to just place it on there and be like that's what i need there you know yeah. something that would have been nice but uh, i love the fish i love them to death i think that was such a great character i like them i noted uh, several times i think i lamented when we would get certain charts later in the game that would tell you where certain things were like all the heart pieces you can actually get a heart uh, excuse me a chart that will tell you where all the heart pieces are and i thought it was an omission like dean said why didn't that chart highlight or cross off the ones i had already gotten for me why did it not update mm -hmm. and and there's another thing too which i, I won't talk about we're going to talk about it next maybe but it's like, why can't it mark off that I've already defeated this or yeah. I've, I've done the platforms on this map or I've done the octopi or I've done the, I've got the heart piece or I've done the submarine. So I thought that was strange. So I, I agree. I agree with, with, you know, it was, um, it was an omission. It was something they could have done. I did it in my phone. Had this been 20 years ago and I well, had a piece of paper, I'd have been annoyed. I, well, I'd know, have been annoyed. And you say that, but for me, like, I like taking notes. I've always taken notes, even when... Like I played those fantasy star games. Nerd. <laughs> the, um... Those are fantastic. <laughs> I publish those notes because like. You know, and I do, and I meant to best. look. I meant to look to see if I still have them because I have a little notebook that I use for my video game uh, playing. And now that I have a phone, you know, like I use a phone right now for Octopath Traveler, but before I had a little notebook where I would sure. make notes for all my games. And sure. so, for me, I guess that was just part of playing the game. I don't know. But what about you, Sorry. Josh? <laughs> um, so I unlocked the 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 entire map about I want to say mid to three quarters of the way through the game. Mm -hmm. um, I actually unlocked uh, the warp, and I was actually warping to tiles that I had never been to before. Um, so I th I found that was, pr was pretty. Fun. And one of them I warped into a fairy, and the fairy was just like, <laughs> "You can't be here." <laughs> 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 Oh really? So, <laughs> it's like you haven't you haven't met a certain person yet. You can't come back when you've met that person, and then we'll talk. Uh, I think I can imagine which one that one was. Yeah. yeah. Nope. So uh, anyway, it was yeah, it was pretty funny. Um, in in many ways, this game could, like you're saying, could have used a like, for lack of a better term, an objective system. Just something that would just say, you know, you've kind of you've kind of been here, you've done this. Mm -hmm doesn't have to be like very detailed in what it's saying but just kind of like a a, a waypoint 
type thing saying this is this is kind of like your next kind of main objective over here um because i uh-huh. found that what would happen is i would play the game and then i would wouldn't be able to play it for a week then i would come back and i have to go where am i going what am i doing what who am i trying to find what am i looking for um i found that very uh i would spend the first hour just trying to catch up to where i was last time mm-hmm. uh, so i found that kind of annoying um so yeah i it, it could just use something i i ended up using um a, a strategy guide up to a point so i wouldn't use the, the guide for the whole thing but I would look to the through the guide. I'm like, okay, I've done up to this point, and it would just look to the next the next point, saying you need to go here and do this. Okay, and then I'll start from there, and then I'll mm-hmm. and then I'll continue on my journey. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So when you go exploring, and when you you know, if you want to be a completionist, you can get all these charts the uh you know like the heart chart and the um ghost ship chart and the light ring chart and all the platform charts and all these charts and then there's also like the tingle chart and i i know like i've kind of put this ahead but we can talk about it now the tingle chart is different in the for the gamecube version and the hd version okay so dean why don't you tell us about getting um well actually i don't know well i i don't don't know if if it's the tingle chart or the triforce chart that i'm thinking of and it might be the triforce chart because like for the triforce like you eric you went and grabbed several triforces before you even were like ready yeah yeah let's hear about i want to yeah let's hear how it worked on the game yeah i want to hear how so dean Dean, tell us how it worked on the gamecube and we'll ask john how that Go ahead, Dean. Sure. Yeah. So, so you do get a chart from Tingle uh, toward the end of the game after you finish uh, sort of those two, quote unquote, final dungeons, um, and it, it, it's sort of like a mysterious chart. It doesn't really tell you exactly what to do, but the concept is that you have to go and find eight Triforce um, maps, and then you have to bring each one back to Tingle one at a time, and then they have you have to pay them. Uh, I think a hundred and maybe 400 rupees, something ridiculous. Um, and then he translates them for you, telling you where the actual Triforce piece is, and then you have to go dredge it up. Otherwise, the the sort of shiny uh, marker on the ocean doesn't appear. So you, you really have to do things in a very specific order, and it turns out to be, um, you know, 24 steps, right? You, you get one map, tingle, Triforce. One map, tingle, Triforce. And it's a super elongated process where just that alone took me more than the rest of the game combined. Really? Yeah. Now, and it's uh, sort of like the penultimate step, right? Before you sort of get to the final dungeon. So it was sort of like a wow, this is this is long. Are the Triforce all in the ocean then? Yeah, yeah yes. I want to so say, fine. well, most of them are anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, John, how'd it work? How'd so it- HD. Uh, you know how many? Do you know how many treasure maps you have to do in uh, for the Triforce pieces in HD, Dean? Three. There's only three Triforce pieces. There's only three Triforce charts. Only oh, three yeah. Charts. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. yeah. You get them all in the other places where you would normally get a chart. You would get just a Triforce piece for completing that that challenge. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. Okay. So it was super easy, and it moved incredibly quickly. So in reality, you needed just a little over one thousand rupees to uh for tingle to interpret the charts for you and it just moved super quick it was the yeah. longest portion but it was also incredibly fast and also those charts were incredibly close to like where you found those charts so you didn't have to travel very far they all seemed to be around where tingle was you didn't have to go very far okay see yeah. that this makes me feel really like it's nice to know that some of the frustrations I had were echoed by other players and eventually changed yeah. and, and that Nintendo was was listening to those. Your your complaints are incredibly valid, though, because oh, yeah. <laughs> if I had to go and spend the 400 rupees for each chart and to do that for all eight pieces, uh, uh, that would be incredibly difficult, especially if you didn't get the the extra money pouch, you know, 
uh, that would be incredibly frustrating and very slow slog, and I would have hated it. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't nearly... I mean, I didn't even know at the time it was nonlinear. I'll say it that way. I was able to, and I can't remember where it was interleaved, but I got a few Triforce pieces because I happened to... Shards, excuse me, because I happened to be exploring for other reasons. I might have been doing... There's a part towards this, maybe the second third of the game where you're doing the sages. Mm -hmm. okay? And we haven't really talked about the progression of the game too mm -hmm. much, but there's a part where you're going to... And so before these major plot points of the game, I would explore and I'd come across a cave or a, a dungeon mm -hmm. and I would... Uh, there'd be a little symbol on the floor and I'd be like, okay, well, I'll play my flute. Uh, uh, sorry, Wind. my Wind Waker. That was a joke. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll play my little musical interlude here and uh, a, a Triforce shard would show up. And I'd be like, okay, well, I know what a Triforce <laughs> shard is. I, at least I can guess. I'm probably going to want this. So I just took it, but it wasn't constrained. Right. I actually got a few. And that's the reason I asked whether they were all in the ocean because they weren't all in the ocean. They were in these other dungeons. And there were only these three maps, like John mentioned. And I only visited Tingle three times mm -hmm. and paid him a little bit of money. And then he told me where they were. But that Triforce thing was weird to me because I didn't even know why I was collecting them. I'm like, well, it's here. I'll take it. It was only towards the end that it was like, you need these to you know, go to the, the mm -hmm. last end. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, good thing I got five good, already. Good thing I got five already. <laughs> but, so it was interleaved very naturally in, in my gameplay anyway. Yeah. Um. So let me ask you guys this about exploring the sea. You know, there are, you know, if you are a completionist, there are, was it 20 hearts you can have for your life? There's 20 total hearts. 20 piece, pieces, uh, containers. Containers. And yeah. I don't know how many you get naturally. 10 maybe oh, and then the know. other 10 you have to get the 40 pieces for yeah. i don't know how many pieces there are yeah yeah so did you guys uh get all the hearts were you 100 percent heart no not even <laughs> close not even, i got 11 total like 11 hearts like that was wow like, yeah wow you, i can't beat the game at 11 <laughs> i need all the bottles filled with fairies and stuff you only got 11 huh yeah, I didn't need I didn't need the other ones. No, <laughs> you're a pro. You're a pro. Yeah. What about you, Josh? Uh, I got 16 in total when I was uh, done. Um, I I only you really used the bottles for fairies. I didn't, I didn't do potions. Uh, I never used Grandma's potion once. Oh, wow. So I was That's just kind cool. of I just used the fairies for everything because like they were free and they gave me most of my hearts back. So yeah. You know, I never did figure out what that one thing was for. Oh, we can talk I, about that. Yeah, we'll talk we should, about that. Yeah, go ahead. And then, what about you, Dean? I know, I know, you saw Eric playing on Twitch, you know, on streaming it, and you made comments. Oh, you have more hearts than I do. So yeah, yeah, you guys were pretty consistently like three hearts ahead of me. So probably yeah, 12, 12 heart pieces ahead. Um, I I ended the game with eleven or twelve, just sort of bridging on that second row. Um, and I, I passed a lot that I knew about. It was just more sailing back to that place and oh, yeah. doing the activity just didn't seem uh, too appealing because I don't want to get into the how easy it was, but the, the challenge just wasn't really there to justify like 20 hearts, right? Especially when you had four bottles of fairies. Okay, none taken. They're calling you out. They're calling you out right now. I know. I feel attacked. <laughs> it's okay. I'm terrible at games. We all know Dean. We all know Dean. All know. I, I made this comment in my Twitch. I, the day I met Dean, I'm like, oh man, I'm in trouble because this guy is good at games. I'm pumping quarters into the arcade and he's just calm as a cucumber. <laughs> Once you see it all, right? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, I did. I, I liked collecting them. It yeah. was fun. I liked to the. I liked the exploration. And Dean. I'll probably say this a number of times. If you ever feel like playing this game again, and you can, play the HD remake, because I really think that the exploration and all that is a lot more fun. Anyway, I, I, I like to get the heart piece. I was always glad. Mm -hmm. And I there were a few, though, at the end where it was like that game of Battleship or whatever, and I'm like, I can't do that. I'm yeah. there. There's somewhere I knew my skill wasn't well, gonna, the, I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to be able to do the, it. The, the uh, leaf, the Deku leaf thing? Yeah, the Deku leaf yeah. uh, thing. But I ended with 19. Mm-hmm. I needed. I had exactly. I needed exactly four. The last four. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't the. I wasn't the winner here. <laughs> I didn't think you were gonna call me out. I'm calling so you out. <laughs> I so I played this. I finished this in 2017. 
Um, and so it's been a few years. So I loaded up my old save to see what I had done. And it turned out that I had gotten all the hearts. She got them all. Now, I will say, though, that I have no problem using a guide. So we oh, have boy. this guy. And I, you know, went and said, oh, I'm going to I'm going to make sure I get everything. And so I completed it by following the guide. I yeah. Nothing well, wrong with that. You still have to do yeah, it. You yeah. know. And I had I didn't look at the guide. So I think Josh was asking me if yeah. I was going to use a guide. <laughs> yeah. Technically, I didn't look at you it until it. I had won the game. But she did. Yeah. And so I <laughs> asked her questions yeah. and I try to get her to answer as little information as she could. <laughs> so I guess in a way. I used a guide, kind of. <laughs> but, Melissa guided uh, you. Mel- yeah. Melissa guided me, so it was it was an indirect. But um, was there anything else? There was. There's a bunch of stuff. There were a bunch of charts. Can we should, can we talk about some of the other sure, things? Can, yes. Some sure. of the side things. We can um, talk about like the side quest stuff. I want to mention a few of them. Okay, mm-hmm. so uh, the Great Octopi. Now I didn't know about these. Like I had I had beat one, but there's there's a number of what, what would you call them? giant sea monsters right yeah. did you guys uh did you guys go after those things there was some good stuff there i think i think i got a couple i liked yeah. them i dug it uh the wii u version makes it a lot easier though because we had an aiming reticle for the uh cannons you don't have that in the gamecube version what oh man Dean. dude i feel like i didn't play this like i'm not a gamer <laughs> i beat the game but it's so easy because yes no. dean, dean gets the dean and john get the street cred for yeah playing the GameCube <laughs> on version. 11 hearts with no reticle and <laughs> yeah. no wind and... holy moly Jeez. game's downright easy by comparison all right any other any let me ask it this way are there any other optional side quests that you guys did or, or liked particularly you know, I, I was surprised at how little the the side quests were sort of incorporated into the main. Lo- like normally, they they sort of dangle a carrot in front of you. Like, okay, go to the auction house for this one part of the main quest, and then if you like it or you know what sort of rewards there are, then you can keep playing. Mm-hmm. Or, or you know, the picto box or um, that that pair that turns you into a seagull. Like, I don't remember any points in the actual game that made you do any of that. Oh, the seagull was used. I loved using the seagull. Did that you have to use it? Yeah. 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 You had to use it to um to get some uh, stuff. You had to get some of the Triforce related things with the seagull. But right. you know, it doesn't make you use it very often. But I just enjoyed being being a seagull and flying around. Oh sure. So yeah, there's there's all these like little side quests that I, I I know they're out there. I just never saw what what the carrot was. Like, why would I go out and do those? And I'm surprised they didn't sort of fold in sort of a mini version of that into the main quest to sort of whet your appetite and say, I'm coming back for more of this later. Can I bring one up in particular that I found so tedious? There were two, Mm -hmm. but one was really tedious and it goes back to something Dean mentioned. I do not know why they did this. Mm -hmm. There was the beautification on Windfall Island where Mm -hmm. you, and I counted, Melissa says, oh, there's not that many. I counted, there must've been 50 of these. Yeah, there was, Mm -hmm. there was. And you could, for some reason, even though you have this little bag, which, from what I can tell, could hold maybe eight items or more. You could only carry three of these beautification items. And I never filled up that bag. That mm-hmm. limit of only three items was completely arbitrary, completely unnecessary, and made this particular thing where you where you have to go around and put these flowers in the different pots at three at a time. And then you had to buy the items. Mm-hmm. I saw, that was I thought that was so bizarre mm-hmm. a choice. To make it purposely limited like that and make them so many that I, I didn't do it. I said, forget it. I'm not doing this. This is insane. Um, did anybody do the beautification? Do you know what I'm talking about? I no, don't even know what they give you. I have you. no I, idea what you're talking about. Okay. Uh, so in Windfall <laughs> Island, there are these little, uh, at a certain point in the story, there's these little, uh, like... Uh, recesses in the land where you can place these yeah. items into it. You had to I've collect seen, the different seen, types. I've seen them around, but I just never and, talked to the right person. Or yeah, and by yeah. putting the right items in the right places and such, you unlock, you get you know rewards for it. And I think there's some heart pieces involved with that. I'm not entirely sure. I haven't done. I did it the first time, and I never did it ever again because I was like, this isn't fun. No, you don't get good feedback on what you like, what you should put, and it didn't. There wasn't such diversity where it felt unique or interesting. It kind of felt like a pain in the butt. <laughs> yeah, I gave up and on it. it was, and it, it, you know, the th- other thing, too, is that that was related to another side quest with the trade merchant. 
Mm -hmm. right? I don't know if you guys are the train merchant. So it was those items that would then be, be available on Windfall Island to buy and then put as statues around the island to beautify it. Yeah. And you had to talk to you had to talk to the guy on the um, bench. He was the one who told you, oh, you know, to beautify the island. Yeah. And then if you talk to him when you were done, you'd get off. Is that piece. right? No, I gave up on that one. I like that the idea like of the trading, the trading with the merchants and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. That's such a great idea, but yeah. they just didn't incorporate it in a compelling way that made me want to do it because it was just for the beautification only. Yeah. If it offered items or activities or unlocking something more engaging, it would have been mm -hmm. so much more fun to do. I like the idea, but they just didn't incorporate it well in the game. Agreed. Agreed. Now, the, the trading trading thing is something that they've been in other Zelda games as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, the only other one I've played with it is uh, Link's Awakening. Mm -hmm. um, and they had the training game. Uh, but I found that to be you would find the people you're trading with along the quest that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this one, I felt I had to purposely go out of my way to find where the merchant was. So yeah. I only did like two or three trades and then I was, I just gave up on it. It wasn't, it wasn't worth it. Uh, another, thankfully I could just look through the trading guide or the, the strategy guide and look to the trading thing and see what the reward was. And I'm like, Oh, I can live without it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So that was, yeah. That yeah, and that then, was one of my least favorite parts. And then the other one too was the Nintendo Gallery. Oh, <gasps> my favorite <laughs> thing. It's my favorite thing in the whole game. <laughs> Is that right? So it's my most favorite thing. Okay, go I go ahead. One of them, and I he's like, I, so I see like eight doors, and I'm like, okay, there's eight of these things. So I give him the thing, and he's like, come back tomorrow. I'm like, come on, give me a break. So I come back whenever, and he says, okay, go in the door, and then I look, and it's, I felt like I was in Raiders of the Lost Ark. There's all these pedestals. And I'm like, holy cow, there's got to be 30 pedestals in here times eight doors. Forget it. I'm done. I couldn't. I, and I'm <laughs> like, and then I realized I, I, I had no idea who to be taken. I'm like, what are all these legendary figures? Well, apparently legendary figures are anybody you can maybe get a full body shot of. <laughs> I think so. I don't know. So tell us about your experience. I, I gave up after like two. So uh, my first two playthroughs on the GameCube, uh, I did all of it. And that involves having to do a second playthrough. Uh, oh my goodness! Uh, and so, the and the Wii U version I did as much as I possibly could before I stopped playing previously. I didn't do it this playthrough because um, I it was crunch for time. But it is like my most favorite thing to do in the world. <laughs> and there was nothing more awesome than on the Wii U version having the picto box and turning it into selfie mode while fighting a boss fight and have Link make a stupid face like while you're about to get hit. It's very is entertaining. Yeah, there's a selfie I'm mode. Playing it. Um, yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah, well, Dude, is it something you unlock? No. Yeah. You, did you it's get color? Did you get? Yeah, I got mode? color. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's, it's just a button there, push. Huh? Yeah. And uh, so I would take pictures of everything all the time. And one of the most amazing things, and I'm going to take a second to talk about the Miiverse. Is it okay if I talk about? Oh that? yeah, please, because we missed that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. This is what makes the Wii U version. Uh, something so magical and so special that was only available for a very limited time because the Miiverse doesn't exist anymore. That's right. for, uh, for listeners who don't know, the Miiverse was Nintendo's integrated social networking system that they had ingrained in the Wii U itself. Uh, every game had a forum uh, where people could post pictures, draw pictures, and ask for help, and, and people can communicate. But they'd also sometimes have in-game mechanics. And in uh, Wind Waker HD, it came in the form of the Tingle Bottle. And it was this thing where you could uh, attach pictures or messages into the bottle and throw it out into the ocean. And what that was was posting onto the Miiverse. And when people would do that, you would also see other people's bottles in the game as bottles yeah. that would wash up on shore. So you would get pictures maybe of a boss that you might have missed for your for your uh, gallery. Um, and you could integrate that and just use that one instead of having to go back and take pictures or play another playthrough, which was very nice. But you would get messages from little kids talking about how this is really cool and people talking about their stories. And some people do like in-character journals that would wash up on shore. And it was such a magical experience That's that you awesome. could only get as a Nintendo thing. And it's stupid sometimes. It's very 
uh, you know, inconvenient sometimes, but it is also incredibly magical and beautiful. Yeah. But uh, I loved it to death. And so I would use, I would take so many pictures and just throw them out to the sea and just see what would happen. And other people would reply and stuff like that. It was very nice. Um, but uh, back onto the uh, the gallery, there is just something really cool about collecting that. Taking pictures to, to chronicle your journey and have them immortalized in this gallery that you can look back on. And look at these enemies that you fought, these characters that you've met, and they have these really cool poses. And it's just, uh, it was something, uh, what we talked about when sailing and having that be a reflective experience. Yeah. Uh, that's very much the case for this for me, is like the most reflective. Uh, where you go back wow. to that place, and you just look, look at all the pictures, and you look at all the stuff, the statues and, and characters that you've met, and the stories you learned. Because it also tells you a little bit about them, too, which is nice. So my character in the game is a lot like me in real life. <laughs> I, I never take enough pictures of anything. And I, I go back and I look and I'm like, is this really all I took a picture of? The hamburger I ate? You got to kidding me. <laughs> but that sounds awesome. Yeah. And I, I, I tell you, I do. I'm I'm kind of sad because that Meverse thing is gone, right? The Tingle yep, can't do it anymore. was deactivated. And I, I even at the time I was playing it, I'm like, boy, I really feel like we're missing out on something here. So that's a shame because that feature is no longer available. Um, but that's nice. Uh, I, I'm learning about all these things I missed. I thought I, I thought I did a good job kind of exploring all this stuff in the game, but I missed the, all the pictures and I didn't know about selfie mode. So I, I, I certainly missed doing all the bosses, right? I didn't do the beautification thing. And one other thing I want to mention is Josh, you posted a picture, I think the other day of your last, you were about to end the game and link, sorry, Josh <laughs> was wearing a mask. Yes. And I had to look that up. I'm like, what, did he, what was that? So I, I, don't, I don't know if we want to talk about it. You, you found this mask, right? What? Yes. Yeah. I found the, the hero's mask in the labyrinth. I forget. Yeah. I think it's just, just, just called labyrinth or is it, I got a specific name. I've heard remember. it was called the savage labyrinth. Savage, savage labyrinth. labyrinth. Yeah. 50 floors of pain or something. Go ahead. Yeah. So you have to do the first 30 to get a Triforce piece. Uh, and then you can you can bow out at that point. But if you continue on to the bottom, uh, down to 50, then you can get the hero's mask. And the hero's mask gives you uh, basically puts a life bar at the bottom of the screen for any enemy you're you're fighting. Yeah. So you know how close they are to to going down. Um, I I found the combat in the game to be the best part of the game. Yeah. Um, I enjoy combat puzzles versus environmental puzzles. Uh, so the environmental puzzles in Zelda, which I, I associate environmental puzzles with Zelda, uh, especially the dungeons, trying to figure out where you got to go and we got to push what piece here and kind of swing from here to here, that kind of thing, hit a switch. That I struggle with constantly. But if you put me in a room of enemies, then I can delegate and I can, I'll run around in circles and I'll get them all into a big group and then I can just strafe and, and pick off a couple of guys. Uh, and so I found the Savage Labyrinth was is basically just that uh so i just i ran through and just continued doing the the whole thing and i i I really enjoyed that and it really prepared me for the final stage for ganon's castle uh at the end because that's pretty much all that is (laughs) yes yes going through like each each like like each enemy came back to you yeah. Oh, the main bosses. Yes. Yeah, there was a, a bo- they call it a boss rush mode. Yeah, the boss I mean, rush. I don't know if they call it that. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about that uh, briefly. So you mentioned sort of the combat puzzles. Um, I I want this is one of my favorite parts of the game too. So let's talk about uh, our experiences maybe with the main dungeons. Right, this is a huge part of Zelda. As I've played more Zelda games, I realize that these dungeons are like. It's like two phases of the same game, right? There's the that, dungeons. And there's dungeons the are the thing. In the, the dungeons are, the yeah, thing. okay. They're, the, I, they're I, the thing. And I'm going to say, I'm going to start, and I'm going to say, when you started this game, you were like. Now don't sell me out. Well, I'm just saying you weren't, you weren't happy. You weren't like enjoying it as much. Oh, yeah. And I, I wanted to get I, to it. A... I'm watching you play and go, what are you talking about? This is great. You go over here. Go sail over there. Go look for this and that. And. Like for me, when it was a dungeon time, I'd be like, I don't want to do that. Like I, I'm too scared to do that. Okay. I'm gonna go sail. And you, when you got to your first dungeon, you were like, Yeah, yeah. this is what I'm talking about. So after having come off Ocarina, yes. so I played Ocarina last year for the first time. Ooh. I want that was 
That was the one I wanted to play before I played anything after it. I said, Ocarina, I got to play to understand everything that comes after it. Mm. So I got off of Ocarina, and I wasn't super thrilled about the dungeons until I reflected on them later. And so when I got into this game, I'm like, I sure hope this is like the dungeons in Ocarina where there's puzzles, there's there's all this stuff that you have to solve and do this stuff. So yeah, I I was very relieved when I got to the first dungeon. It's like, okay, this is what I'm here for. Mm-hmm. This I don't want to talk to old ladies on Windfall Island. Sorry. <laughs> I, I want to be in the dungeon. Well, so, you don't want to talk to the gossiping kids? Like, <laughs> no, no. That was that was too much too soon. I wanted to I was hoping to get into the game early. But but yes, I really enjoyed the dungeons. I love the puzzles. Um I love, you know, I, well, I don't want to I don't want to monopolize this section. So so maybe we'll go to Dean. We haven't heard from Dean yeah. for a while. Dean, tell us about your experience with the dungeons or the temples or whatever they're called. Oh well, the GameCube version had dungeons as well, so there's there's one Ooh. common thing between. <laughs> oh, kind the of two. All right. Yeah, no, it was uh, you know dungeons. Uh, I guess like you, they're always my favorite part of a Zelda because they 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 sort of follow the the usual trope or the usual pattern of you're gonna get a really cool item, and that item is gonna yes. be uh, the highlight of solving the puzzles in that particular dungeon, and you're gonna sort of unlock new gates throughout the world. Once you finish and there's always a fun boss at the end. So, I mean, they were really cool. I would have actually liked more. Um, Like I said, you know, you sort of had that forsaken fortress at the beginning, which I wouldn't really consider a dungeon. So there were only like four or five like actual dungeons in this game, which is pretty, you know, a pretty small roster in comparison with some of the other Zelda games I've played. And then the Triforce section at the end is longer than the entire game combined, and none of that is 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 dungeons. So I would have liked to have seen sort of more uh, varied dungeons. But what I did play was actually really cool, sort of as a counterpart to um, the uh, the Tingle Bottle that that John was talking about. Uh, in the GameCube version, you have something called the Tingle Tuner. Mm. So if you hook up your Game Boy Advance with a Game Boy Link cable to the GameCube, it sort of acted like a a Wii U pad where it showed you the dungeon map and then Tingle was sort of uh, helping you through solving some of the puzzles. Now I didn't use it the whole way through, but you could also like collect statues and it was like a whole uh, sort of elaborate add on that you could also play along with the, the Game Boy Advance, which was, which is actually really cool. It still works. Yeah, um, the Tingle Tuner is so good because it also was a thing that would introduce um, kind of a cooperative play because the person on the Game Boy Advance could throw bombs. You pay rupees for yeah. Tingle to drop bombs and, and help you in combat yeah. as a way for like parents to engage with their kids or vice versa. You know, um, it was really cool. I liked it a lot, too. Sorry. Continue. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. I mean, I think had I had somebody sort of sitting beside me and, and you know, utilizing that that sort of commerce piece of it would have been really cool as well. Um, or sort of the co-op piece, but even the dungeons as they were, like they were fun to solve. I really tried to avoid ever using a, um, a strategy guides because I, I felt like the puzzles were just complicated enough. They weren't like Ocarina Water dungeon hard, but they were, um, you know, still still got you thinking. Um, the the wind one, the wind temple was probably one of my favorites. I wish that the Deku Leaf didn't use uh, your magic. Oh, or yeah. your stamina meter because yeah. i felt like there was so much trial and error of like where do i need to go here and, and then i would just end up like going back and forth between room to farm my stamina meter back up and then i'd try again but that that was probably one of my one of my favorites now did you um did you get your stamina meet a meter all the way up did you find i i got it doubled yeah like I found that, a, a fairy that sort of yeah, yeah yeah so that that was very helpful Okay. For sure, but but one other sort of HD improvement is that um, with the GameCube and, and just sort of the wonky camera and 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 the depth perception, it was really hard to know where you were going to land when mm-hmm. you use the That's the right. Deku Leaf. Yeah, and the HD version actually, I guess, has a marker or some sort of maybe mm-hmm. Link's shadow or something to show you. Okay, here's where you're going to land when you let go of this leaf. Because more often than not, I would I would fall into the abyss and have to start in the previous room. Yep. Dude. You didn't have any marker to show where you land on the GameCube version. Oh, man, am I glad I played the Wii. The Wii yeah. You used I'd that. have been going crazy. Yeah, yeah, I use it all the time because I, I, even with it, I had trouble in some places. I'm like, why did I fall off the edge? All right. All right, John, do you have anything you want to say about the dungeons or anything? 
Uh, I love the very first three dungeons. I did not enjoy the last two dungeons. And the final Ganon confrontation was... Not the Ganon confrontation. The dungeon leading up to Ganon was really bad. <laughs> That's um, the boss rush. Yeah, I don't the enjoy bosses. boss rushes. And um, I felt that uh, the 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 boss fight before Ganon was really bad. We'll talk about that at another point. But um, as for the... the um, the sage dungeons, the two sage dungeons, right? Um, there, it was really slow, even on the Wii U version, because you had to use the song of the like, command to control yeah. the other characters. I really wish it was just like hit the right bumper, and you know, instead of calling them, you just controlled them. Oh, that's a like, good idea. Yeah, having to stop and do the song, and it's even worse on the the GameCube version because you have to go into your inventory and get your baton because you can't. You yeah. wouldn't have it with you normally in the dungeon. You wouldn't really need it for anything. Um, and so that was that was tedious. Um, but they're not bad. It's just those were the weaker ones, I felt. I didn't enjoy them as much as I did the, the first three dungeons that you had. And I also really enjoy um, the non-conventional dungeons. Uh, the Like the Forsaken Fortress and stuff like that was actually really interesting. Having used stealth the first time you're in there instead of having to be like, you know, guns blazing. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Oh yeah, yeah. I want to oh. mention the Four Second Fortress. The first time I got there, I somehow found, I guess, the critical path through it, and That's... I was very nervous. Melissa was, Melissa was like, "Don't worry, don't worry." And I'm like, "Okay, I believe you." I, I, I found the critical path through it, and I'm like, "I didn't get to explore everything. I didn't. There's more I want to see here." And fortunately, Kid, yeah, Kid Me was one uh, when I played it the first time. That probably took me probably 12 hours. <laughs> like young me couldn't get through the Forsaken Fortress because I didn't understand stealth mechanics. Because you had way. to sneak, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, I don't understand. This is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to point out to Josh's point about the combat being so fantastic and also to talk about Dean mentioning that the game is incredibly easy. Those two things go hand in hand. This is probably one of the best combats in a Zelda game in general. It gives you so many tools. Um, every item can be like almost every item has a valid uh, like strategy against an enemy. And so they can be used in a variety of different ways. And that's why the game becomes a lot more easy because you had so many tools to use and be expressive in your combat. And it was just so much fun. Nothing is more awesome than finding uh, you know, the, the night guys, I don't know my Zelda enemies, even though I've played so many of them, the <laughs> night guys, um, yeah. dark nuts, dark nuts. Thank you. Um, and you know, uh, dodging around them and hitting them in the back to expose their armor. Yes. Like that, that stuff is so much fun Yes, uh, to be able to do that. And I think that that was just one of the major, uh, benefits of its combat system was that it just gave you all of these tools to play. Like when you fight a Stalfos, right? Most of you guys probably just hit it with a sword until its skull fell down and you hit the skull with your sword, right? Yeah. Yeah. I use the hammer and it kills the skull immediately. Like when you when he, his skull's bopping around, I just use the hammer and it just squashes it instead. Yeah. It's like instant done. And That's I was right. like I did that a couple times. Yeah, yeah. That's my, my method of doing that. And like the the pea hats are flying around. You can use your leaf to make them go grounded. Yes. You can use uh your boomerang to cut off their stuff and then attack them. Or you can just use your arrows. Or you can use the hammer and squash them. Like everything had a method that could be used for it to help you from not having to navigate those menus a million times on the yeah. game version. Uh and it's so much fun, but that makes the game easier. Because they yeah. gave you so many options and gave you so many tools uh, to succeed. Um, and I loved it to death, though. It is its best feature. The combat is so much fun. And I did sound, enjoy the combat. The sound when you make a, when you land a strike, you know, just the little ding, you know, the, the, that goes with the music. And it has this, this feedback that is so monumental. And it's so much yeah. fun to do when you just hear a strike, when you land a strike on an enemy and uh, those those audio cues were so much fun. It, had, it gave a rhythm to it that was uniquely its own. Sorry. Yeah, I noted when I was playing it and you would land multiple strikes in a row, it almost played like a mute, like a there, there were different pitches. It almost played like a, a musical song. It was like ding, 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 ding. I don't know. I, I yeah, I I'll second that. I I really enjoyed the combat in this game and I was I actually having fun like when those knights whatever you call them. I, oh, don't, man. I don't Dark nuts, yeah. When they came along, I'm like, yeah, okay, I can do my little, I'm going to wait for you, and I'm going to use the A dodge, and I'm going to go around behind you. And, yeah. yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was. I, I definitely enjoyed the combat. 
Did you guys, something that I don't think I did, at least I don't remember doing it, that you did, Eric, was you could use your um, hook mm -hmm. and yes. steal. Did you oh. guys steal? Oh, the and stealing. it visually yeah. steals it, too. It Like, if you take the belt off of them, the belt's gone off their the belt's character. gone, yeah. It's so I cool. That. Mm -hmm. that was a lot of fun. So, yeah, I'd go up to those guys and I'd steal the butterfly necklaces or the skull the joy necklaces. And I'd steal mm -hmm. some things and I'd do that first and then I'd attack them. I never noticed that until this playthrough that you actually took it off the model of the character. I never noticed it. Someone pointed it out. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> it's pretty cool. That's really cool. I didn't realize you could do that at all. So that, yeah. that's the hook shot then. You just yeah, hit it. No, yeah, yeah, the, hook shot, the grappling hook. Grappling the hook. Grappling yeah. hook. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, not the hook shot. Sorry, the grappling, grappling hook. hook. Yeah. So, I so okay. Know. So how, how do you use the grappling hook as a weapon? Because any, is, is that an HD thing? Because anytime no. you use it, you just lock like on. wail it. It's lock you, on. You lock on, yep. Really? Okay. Yep. If I'm going to have to try that. And, yeah. Okay. That's cool. Um, can I ask, in the GameCube version, so in the, sorry, in the Wii U version, the um, the cannons, the Wind Waker, and the grappling hook when you're on the boat, all that is um, assigned to the D-pad on the Wii U version. What, in the GameCube version, what is the D-pad used for? Is it used for anything? No, no, and and that's why I was so surprised when I saw it on the in the UI when Eric was playing when Eric was streaming. Um, it would have been such a smart idea to just put your sort of permanent level items like your your Wind Waker onto the D pad. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, it just maybe maybe it was used for. I certainly didn't use it for much. Maybe it was toggling for between. So they had the option; they things. just chose not to use it. Yeah, so you you really have your A, your X, and your Z. I think are the three buttons that you can assign or a Y X. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you can assign on the game. Anyway, you have three. So yeah. when you're sailing, you really want your cannon, you want your dredge and you want your, your, um, your sail. You have to have the sail equipped as well. No, yeah. but like, w like when you started going, you had to have the sail equipped and then, oh. I mean, you could unequip it once you started sailing, but it, yeah, it's a pain. Wow, that's really yeah. annoying. When um, you keep, it, or we, you just hit the A button and you just start sailing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> um, nice. Well, part of that comment though on um, like you know, why didn't they use the D pad? I think a lot of that has to do with just inexperience with design at that at that time. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. this was again early in the GameCube's lifespan. Uh, that was an unheard of thing to like assign items to a D pad. The D pad's used yeah. for moving around in 2D plane. Why would anyone use that as a secondary thing? Like their brain, nobody yeah. knew that that was the case. Um, they hadn't quite tapped the the potential of the controller to its fullest amount. You know, they were still working with you had a D pad or a control stick and your buttons, and that's it. And you didn't use. If you use the, the thumbstick, you're not using that D-pad, and vice versa. Never, ever. But uh, I, I'm glad that you did. It was so much nicer to have that on that D-pad. Now, <clears throat> the one thing I have to I have to make a comparison, because other than Breath of the Wild, this is the only 3D Zelda game I've played. Um, and that being said, I think that Wind Waker almost seems like a direct prequel to Breath of the Wild in a lot of ways. A lot of the uh, Eric, you said you like the combat combat mechanics. That is like all of Breath of the Wild. Um, the open seas in Wind Waker. That is the open plains and the open ground of of Breath of the Wild as well. Um, even the Savage Labyrinth. Uh, they added that as basically DLC and the Master Trials on the Breath of the Wild. So all these things are coming into play. Uh, all I having played Breath of the Wild first. As I'm playing Wind Waker, I'm like, oh, that was in Breath of the Wild. Oh, they brought this from mm -hmm. Breath of the Wild. Or, oh, man, sorry. Yeah. yeah, everything from all the good stuff for Breath, from Wind Waker is in Breath of the Wild. Mm -hmm. So if you like a lot of the, the Breath of the Wild stuff, I haven't said Breath of the Wild that many times ever. Since, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, you're going to find out if you start playing the other 3D Zelda games, especially the later ones, you're going to find that there are bits and pieces of all of those games mm -hmm. that are really great. And those are what's in Breath of the Wild. When you play Skyward Sword, you're going to see a lot of that stuff put into Breath of the Wild. Yeah. And all for it's better and it's, and it's uh, you know, enhancement of that game. But absolutely. Um, 
which is why uh, I and I don't know if we're going to talk about this, but why I also feel that the movement into Twilight Princess is actually a major step back for the Zelda franchise before they decided to move forward because that was very traditional and nothing was taken from uh, Twilight Princess into <laughs> Breath of the Wild. <laughs> um, and it was just very much for the fans. And it, But for something like Wind Waker, it does so many different things. And it's, it's such a very bold game, not just in its visual, you know, its aesthetics. It's very much more bold in terms of uh, its sound design, its mechanics, um, and even its story and, and pacing. It's very different than what you would typically get in a Zelda game. And what makes Wind Waker so interesting is just that it is almost a perfect storm of all of these elements together this merging of art and mechanics all together and and in using art into their game design you know being able to recognize things that you need to utilize in the environment like with the grappling hook and all having these really striking visuals that can help guide you in knowing where you need to go in dungeons and stuff like this they did a fantastic job with it and it's so amazing i love it to death sorry tangent <laughs> ended <laughs> let's Let's can we segue yeah, into let's, that? Yeah, let's let's talk about the graphics. You know, yeah. uh, this this was different, right? And the cell shading. Mm -hmm. It was a it was a disappointment to some people yes, because they had people. revealed. Oh, now, oh, I, oh, if yeah. you guys remember, or oh, my yeah. memory of it is, they had shown, and I never, I don't even remember what it was, but they had shown coming off of Ocarina, or maybe even Majora's Mask, yeah. they had shown a more realistic game mm -hmm. at some point, and everybody was like, "Oh my gosh." This is what Zelda is going to look like in the next generation, mm -hmm. the GameCube generation. Mm -hmm. And then the game, then they showed it again, and it was all of a sudden, it was this cell-shaded cartoony uh, graphics. And there was a lot of, uh, I don't know what the right word is, pushback, disappointment. Yeah, pushback from that. Yeah. Um, I hadn't played any Zelda games, really, except for maybe even the first one at that point. I don't, So I didn't have an opinion. What, yeah. what were your guys' opinions? And, you, John, you mentioned... You thought that the graphics were a necessity to telling this story. So mm -hmm. what, tell us about this cell shaded. What what happened? Oh, my goodness. So people got really mad. They saw a cutscene, uh, a, like a pre-rendered cutscene showing the graphical prowess of the GameCube. Uh, it's nothing more different than, you know, all these different technical demos that they showed at the time. This was in 2000 uh, when they showed this off. Mm -hmm. And uh, people wanted that, which is why we got... Um, Twilight Princess in the first place is very much a we're sorry all you mad people we'll make a game for you and mm -hmm. here's Twilight Princess it's the most traditional Zelda it's very very plain and uh and dark and gritty and here you go it's throwing them a bone but uh -huh. people were very angry about it because this was uh during the height of um uh the media and advertising telling you what is cool and what's yeah. awesome. You want edgy. You want no girls allowed. No kids allowed. Games are for, for men. You know? Uh -huh. And so it had this massive toxic masculinity that's just running rampant. And this environment, the internet, of course, is now becoming a major force at this point. Um, and so that internet culture is also just very toxic. And it's a lot of people just getting very mad over video games. <laughs> <laughs> but the visuals are amazing. You look at Link, right? How expressive is he? There has been no Link since him, since Toon Link, that has been as expressive. Even in Breath of the Wild, not nearly as expressive as what you get in that character. Yeah. And they play it into their comedy. They play it into those dramatic elements. I mean, no person can tell me that the final fight in Breath of, or in Wind Waker is one of the most visually striking moments in a game is fantastic and it chills down my spine even just thinking about it. <laughs> I loved it. I, I was right there with with sort of the the angry mob. Uh, you know, I was 13, 14 at the time in, in 2000. And uh, I remember having this, this weird sense of ownership over Ocarina. And like, that's Link. Like Ocarina of Time is Link. And then what we saw in the GameCube, that's where Link needs to go sort of that dark gritty path. And when, when we got Toon Link and, and it, it was that cartoony cell shaded, I just, I, I wasn't a fan. And then John, to your point, like playing through it now, you know, the, 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 the hyper expressions that you're able to convey on Link's like gigantic head are, are <laughs> so important <laughs> for, for, for a silent protagonist, right? Yeah. Like this, he, he doesn't talk. He never talks. He just grunts his way through Hyrule and you're, you're able to, you know, 
absorb so much of what he's feeling, what he's thinking. You're able to, um, you know, understand the comedy that the game designers are trying to get across all through these facial expressions with his gigantic eyeballs and tiny nose and mouth. Like there's not a lot of detail there, but there's a lot of expression. And I think that was, you know, a huge, I don't want to say it's a selling point, but having played it now, it was a huge standout um, sort of effect that, that made the game experience that much better. One of the things that they did that they very much highlighted when that game had come out was like, hey, when there's something important in an area, Link's eyes are looking at it. When you've locked onto something or if you, you have a the little reticle over something, Link is looking at it. And his head is turning, his eyes are looking at it, and you can see those things. And so they're very much like, look at this, because that wasn't a common thing at that time. Uh, having these visual cues that the protagonist is even giving the player on, look at this thing, it is very important. Mm. Uh, and like in magazines and in interviews, that was like one of the things that they constantly mentioned was we're using the art to also help players mechanically understand what they need to do and to draw their attention to places. Uh, and that was a big deal. It was a big deal at the time. For sure. So do you but think that, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead, Eric. I was just going to ask, I mean, do you think, why do you think they chose this art style? Was it for those reasons, the, the expressiveness or these, these gameplay hints? I mean, because they made a conscious choice, right? They had t- turned 180 degrees. Yeah, we say it turned 180 degrees, and I don't think that's actually very the ca- much the case at all. Much to the aggravation of those people who still cling to that idea that uh, that Zelda has always been dark and gritty. Uh, you look at the NPC characters in Ocarina of Time in Majora's Mask, and you look at the characters, the NPCs in Wind Waker. They actually are still designed very similarly in terms of their art. Uh, and their proportions, they're always this very exaggerated and almost caricature um, style. And uh, so those things have always been there in Zelda. And all this wanted to do was create a more uh, dynamic and artistic representation of this. Um, Nintendo took something incredibly uh, important from one of their competitors, uh, from Sega in particular, um, that Sega in the 32-bit era, and uh, as well as on the Dreamcast, so the Sega Saturn, the Dreamcast, they really had a major emphasis on art design as well as music, um, kind of uh, integrated in their mechanics. And you can see that from the GameCube era on, Nintendo very much was like, we are really making a major focus to try very different visual styles, to really um, push art, to push music and sound and put those into those mechanics and do something very different. You know, Nintendo, they're like, if I can't do something different, I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. And so with Wind Waker, it's very much like one of those moments where they're starting to really push this idea that you can have this major amalgamation of all these different things to work towards the benefit of helping a player. And I think it's so important. It was so important, but that's just me. <laughs> no, you got to figure it really, really helped play into, um, you, you know, some of the mechanics that the game introduces, like, When you talk about the draw distance, like this game has incredible draw distance on the GameCube. Like you can see islands that are like three squares away. They're just silhouettes, but it's cell shaded, right? There's not a ton of detail, but there's still so much happening around you with, like I said, the seagulls flying by and the barrels popping up with the rupees and the The waves and everything. Yeah, the weather weather effects. Like it. I, I'm sure that if the game was running on an engine like Twilight Princess and still trying to generate those off in the distance, uh, you know, attract points that that to try and guide you there, you know, the, the hardware limitations would hit a point where it just couldn't do that. So I'm sure that the the aesthetic, although cartoony, uh, really helped play into a lot of uh, what they were trying to do as well. I want to mention constellations. I'm just throwing out. <laughs> Yeah, looked in the night sky. There are actually Earth. I don't think this is on purpose, but I recognized a few Earth constellations like the Dipper. Big, I forget which one. Orion was Orion. in there. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many others. Maybe all twelve of the major. How whatever nice! They are. How nice huh? is that? How nice it was is great. that? I love I when they do that stuff. Them. I took <sighs> pictures. I'm like, oh, I got a yes! clear shot. This is beautiful. Okay, I, I wanted to go back to Josh. Josh, uh, any comments about the the graphics or anything like that? Uh, I wasn't in uh, in a uh, North American 
uh, country when this was released, so I was uh, not even aware of GameCube or Zelda being... I didn't know the controversy or anything like that, so I didn't really care. They, when when I did see the game, I was like, oh, that looks kind of cool. Like, how many years, dec- like a decade later, when I finally saw it, I'm like, oh, looks cool. Yeah. I, yeah. Wasn't into, I wasn't into Zelda at that point at all anyway, so I didn't really care. Um, but playing the game... The graphics or the, the the art style is like the 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 smallest thing that I notice really. Yes, it doesn't it doesn't affect my opinion of the game one way or the other. Uh, other than saying I like the game, but it it wouldn't make me dislike the game because of an art style. Um, so as far as controversy, uh, there are other things that that I hold more important than what a game. N- looks like for the sure. most part you want it to play nice uh, that's yeah you want the controls to work you know i'll say this the graphics the art style they chose um ended up being really great for an hd re-release oh yeah uh, great. because it doesn't look aged nope. uh and the hd is just the first time i saw this game in hd mm-hmm. i'm like this is gorgeous this yeah. this game really did a great job of, it really pops of, of yeah. mer- moving into hd um okay okay you want i want to talk about music yeah let's talk about i mean go up with graphics goes music right there it's it's zelda I, there's always good music right there is good oh, yeah. music you know you guys um, want yeah there's there's the you know when you find an item oh know, that's song, classic is, yeah you know classic but you know what about like other music or are there any like favorite music parts of you know different islands or when you're sailing or whatever um, Josh, you want to tell us what you thought of the music? I, I really like the music. Um, I like how the music really adds to the atmosphere of the game. Um, my, one of my favorite additions is when you're playing, when you're, especially when you're sailing at night, there is no music. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's that absence. Uh, you feel alone. Uh, you can't even really see the silhouettes of the islands. Like we were saying, you really feel a- alone in, in this uh, giant seascape. Um, so that was really interesting. Really interesting, and the my favorite mu- music overall, I think, is in uh, Hyrule Castle. I think <sighs> yeah. that is just. <laughs> I didn't even want to leave. I just sat in there and just listened to the music play. Um, you're in there for such a short amount of time, so I had to really make it make it count. But yeah, <laughs> of all the music, that was the one I I really just sat there and and let it play. Okay, John. It stole my thunder there. Hyrule Castle's the best. It is the best. <laughs> it, it creates this haunting, you know, sensation and feeling mixed with this ability to tell a story visually without any words. Being in Hyrule Castle was such an awe-inspiring moment in that game that was uh, such a holy crap, like, what is going on? Yeah. And that music elevates it dramatically and how it changes, you know? Um, it was just such a fantastic piece. I mean, all the music is great. I also love that the music also changes if you are going slow or going fast while sailing. Yeah. Like, right. the music changes in those great and dynamic ways. It's so good. So good. I love it. The sailing music, well, that was oh, a callback to the original Zelda, wasn't the ori- the, Z- what is the Zelda theme? <laughs> Am I right? The, 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 wasn't that, that, that's in the sailing music, right? Oh yeah, they they incorporate a lot of um, the the theme into it into their own unique kind of way. Uh, yeah. they absolutely, it's all in there, and you'll you'll hear that theme in everything, even in the Hyrule Castle. You, you can hear these things; they're they're in there. It's really interesting. I would say the sailing music is is my favorite. I like the yeah. sailing music too, but I have another favorite which okay. we'll get to. Dean. What about Dean? Yeah. Oh, I I love the music. Um, you know, I, I can't play a look of anything. I don't know music theory. I don't know much about music at all but i can tell just from like the instruments that they use even without knowing that this is a zelda game there was so much that felt like zelda you know like even like just the beginning when you start up the game and you watch that sort of um historic recap of what happened to hyrule like the, the music that's playing is is played with the ocarina you you think ocarina of time before you even really like know what you're talking about right when you got the title theme and it plays like 
like on the flute and then you got the violin kick in and you got the harp like it sounds like a piratey theme you know this is going to be like a a ship game you know it's going to be on the water you can know so little about this game and still get so much uh, emotion and and narrative through the music that um you know i I think it works works really well but i would agree The, the the ocean theme for me like that moment where you kick off and you start sailing and you're going yeah. with the wind and, and that music <laughs> is playing and those like you got those like triumphant trumpets like playing in the back like you feel so good like, and the seagulls are struggling song. to catch up to you yeah, you know? yeah. I, can all, I can almost feel the wind in my hair you know like i can always like almost feel like oh, i'm yeah. there on the boat yeah. so i i don't want to mention we're gonna so we have some feedback yeah. from some club and i'm gonna i want to mention one and that's gonna go, gonna come up here too okay. i listen to um there's a website called oc remix are you guys familiar with oc remix it's people who do remixes oh, yeah. of video game music and i've downloaded quite a bit of it and i like to listen to it while i'm working because it's music it's instrumental for the most part and i had never played wind waker but i had downloaded a number of the tracks from wind waker and this happened with ocarina too i knew all the music before i played the game so I had become very familiar with this one piece on OC Remix called The Pirates of Dragon Roost Isle. That is such and a good song! I love that remix. And I, I and, and because of that, I really like the Dragon Roost song. That's become one that I've been familiar with for years before I even knew the, the game. And so um, I knew a lot of these songs, but the Dragon Roost one was one that I think is one of my favorites uh, for years. Um, but we had so we had some other we, uh, yeah. feedback too, right? Correct. Yes, uh, we you know there was a, a tweet that went out, and so some of the cl- um, club's favorite tracks are Rocket Sauce says he's always been a fan of the opening theme, and he will let it play every time he fires up the game. Yeah, so that's like Josh through. sitting in the yeah. cast, right? You just want to enjoy the music yeah. without the game. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, Kyle three two five says he really enjoys the an orchestral version of the Dragon Roost. Yes, like you were talking about. As soon as I saw him, yes. I, I went and listened. Yeah, because I'm like, oh, I love this song. Let's yes. hear, it. and it's good. Yeah, it's very and he, good. He says it, it blows his pants off every, every time. time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm hearing it right now. It's really yeah. amazing. Yeah. Like you hear it in your head. And then Red Big Knight enjoys uh, the title music from I guess E3. It it actually didn't make it into the final game. But he, um, like I said, it harkens back to uh, Link to the Past. I wonder if that's available somewhere. I'll have to look that up. I'll look that up. So yeah, good good music, right? The game. Uh, And even Forsaken Fortress, which I couldn't, it's like what, four notes? Yes. And I couldn't think of what it is, doom, 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 whatever. And it it stuck in my head for like an hour. But um, all good stuff, Mm -hmm. all great stuff. All right, uh, so, you know, we kind of talked a little bit about the release and the reaction to it, you know, especially due to the uh, cell shading. Um, But um, I guess there's also maybe some reviews that were out there. John, have you got something for us here? I don't have any, but, like, here's the thing, right? The vast majority of the reviews were, like, this is a 10 out of 10 game. This is fantastic and revolutionary. But then there's, like, one or two that are very toxic and very, like, this is a 0 out of 10 game. Are you mad? Um, But they're the minority, and they're such a vocal minority. It makes you wonder, you know, was that outrage even necessary or even real? And it absolutely was. But it doesn't feel like it when you just look at the reviews. User reviews are very different. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Did you want to do? Um, did you want to do your game now? Yes. Let's do it. Okay, folks. Listen, I'm a guest on this podcast here. This is my first time doing so. Hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> and this is like being, me being a guest at a house party here. I have to bring myself a wonderful quiche. I brought you guys a delicious and delectable game here. It's really quick. All right. I'm going to present to you a user review that I plucked from Metacritic, all right? And you're gonna have to tell me, there's no no score, we're not keeping score, there's no winners here, but you're gonna have to tell me. We're all whether, winners, John. We're all winners, exactly. Okay, so we're all losers. There's no winners here, <laughs> only losers. Only losers, <laughs> we're all losers, it's okay. Um, you have to tell me, is this a review of Wind Waker or Wind Waker HD, it doesn't matter, you know? Um, or is this a review of something else, okay? Okay. You guys ready? Yeah. Yes. All right. The most overrated game in the series, so overrated that those who are neutral or negative about the game will be offended and humiliated by many. 
Although the gray mass believes only the majority, only a few dare to say that the game is not good. Is that Wind Waker or something else? <laughs> I might think of a few games that that could be from, <laughs> but uh... I'm gonna say something else. Yeah, th- this review is saying it's a, a highly overrated game, and I've never known Wind Waker to be overrated. So I'm gonna say this is from something else, and I might even hazard a guess as to what it is. But uh, go ahead, Josh or Dean. I'm gonna say it's Wind Waker just to be just to be counter. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's edging his bets, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna say it's something else as well. <gasps> what what game did you think it would be if you were gonna say something else? You had an idea, so what? What? Uh... I do. Yeah, I have an idea. What do you think? I, I, I'd say you know one of the one of the games that people like to be the most contrarian on that's often claimed as the best in the series is Final Fantasy VII. Oh, yeah. uh, it is something else, and it is Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. That review is by Silver1995. Interesting. <laughs> All right, are you guys ready yeah. here? Yeah. yeah. All right. While the game has some minor pacing and audio problems, the brave new art style, tightly evolved gameplay, and humorous story take the famous series in a bright new direction. There's no way somebody can bash the audio in this game. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to say this is not Wind Waker. That, that's the only thing, too, that kind of gets me because it says it said something bad about the Well, audio. it said humorous, and I didn't find Wind Waker to be humorous. Yeah. I'm going to say something else also. Hey, Josh. Josh, what you got? I'm sticking with Wind Waker. <laughs> it's Wind Waker. It's Wind Waker. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Game so Revolution fun. was the site that reviewed Wind Waker and said oh. that about it. <laughs> oh, I was a critic. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was a critic that said oh, that. Oh, wow. Wow, I know, right? We're not going to trust them. <laughs> All right. In terms of what is an offer for a veteran gamer or someone who is familiar with the franchise, you will find this is a lacking option with not a lot of change, variation, or improvements. Motion control issues hamper the experience for anyone going for a full completion. And the rest of what you will see will remind you of a Wii game from 2007. As a family game, Blank offers a serviceable experience for your children and nothing else. Well, it's definitely not the GameCube version. Say that. (laughs) Yeah, they must be talking about the Wii U version, but I don't remember there being a lot of was oh, there most? So there was one. There's a lot of motion controls in I, Wind Waker HD. Absolutely, there is. I can, I turn them yeah, like the arrows. I had and trouble with also, the. Also, at first, it had you know motion controls in the controller, and you had to turn that off. I turned it off. Yeah, and I so forgot I about it. I am going to say that's Wind Waker. I think that's Wind Waker. What about everybody else? What do you think? I don't know. No. I'm going to say something else. Oh. All right. All right. You're well, going to be the lone. I'm going to always say something else. All right. I'm going to say something. okay. It is something else. That oh, is Cooking wow. Mama Cookstar for the Switch. <laughs> <laughs> Cooking Mama. Um, the, the motion controls in Wind Waker are fantastic, and I use them exclusively, and they are the best. Really? That's, just my, that's my state. That's my stance. Okay. All right. All right. Guys, get ready. This game is definitely a marvel, but by no stretch of the imagination is it perfect. The humor in the game is crude, which I found to be repugnant. The garbled voices pushed me to the brink of insanity, and the vast majority of the game is mind-numbingly easy. However, despite its shortcomings, the game is an absolute joy to play. The breathtaking graphics, beautiful soundtrack, and polished gameplay are alone enough to merit a purchase. One of the game's biggest strengths is, in my opinion, its magical undertones. It all seems so merrily surreal that I just couldn't leave the television harboring all sentiments. All in all, a truly wonderful game. Is that Wind Waker or something else? They mentioned humor again. I don't I don't remember the game having any particular humor, but... I got humor say, out of Wind Waker. It sounds it's like a No More Heroes crude. or something. Yeah, it's not like crude humor? I don't know. That doesn't sound like Wind Waker. I think I'm going to say something else. But somebody also did mention that the sound was bad in Wind Waker. <laughs> what do you say, Josh? Something else or Wind Waker? I'm going to say something else. Dean, what do you think? Yeah, I'm going to say something. It's like Stick of Truth or something. It's like a South Park game. Yeah, I'm going to say something else, too. All right, we're going to something else. It is something else. It was hey. a Tommy. 
Okami. Okami. Oh, it was Okami. Oh. Huh? Yeah. Crude humor in Okami? I know, right? <laughs> uh, no, the, there was some crude humor in Okami. There was oh, some, okay. like, peeping Tom nonsense. Uh, okay. Um, oh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> all right. You ready? Perhaps the least forgivable aspect for me, given my love of exploration and discovery in games like these, is that all the islands feel the same. For Blank to be a truly unforgettable experience for me, I'd have liked to have seen islands and archipelagos that feel lovingly crafted with supreme attention to detail. What we have instead is a map that feels like Blank turned Generate Game on once and just ran with what the creator spat out. This, more than anything else, saddens me, as it makes things feel even less devoid of life. Islands are too spread out, too samey, and too uninteresting, leaving the player with a seen one, seen them all feeling. Wind Waker or something else? That's got to be something else as well. Why do you think something else? Because there's really not that many islands, and I wouldn't say they're all the same. They're all, like, tiny. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say this you is like a me. dagger fall or something. <laughs> I thought the islands were pretty different too, but I don't know a lot of games with islands. I'm gonna say something else. I'm gonna I'm gonna say Wind Waker because I just think this is like a bad review. Okay. Yeah, you gotta remember these are good and bad. These are user reviews. <laughs> yeah. I'm going with Wind Waker on this one. Yeah. It is something okay. else. That is Sea oh. of Thieves by Steviver. Oh, Sea of Thieves. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. All right. Um, even if this game had the best graphics in the world, this would probably be one of the most overrated, poorly designed games I've ever bought in my life, being made only as a result of the publicity of other games. Stop giving this sorry game pity votes. Hmm. I don't know. That's a tough one. It's weird to knock the game's graphics because I thought they were actually pretty nice. Like, I remember you, the you know what, out for it. Yeah, yeah. You know, what, I'll, I'm gonna go with Wind Waker. This is like Wind a Wind GameCube Wind. Wind Waker. Okay. Like pre-acceptance of Toon Link Wind Waker. Josh, what you thinking? I'm thinking Wind Waker too. I am too, actually. Nope, something else. <laughs> It's Wind Waker. Ah! That was that was JB's review of Wind Waker. All right, we've just got a couple more. We'll be real quick here. All right, um, let's see. Da, 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 da. I played this on demo at a local game store. The sounds were annoying, as every time the protagonist moved, he made a stupid sound. The graphics were too cartoony and a big turnoff. The gameplay counterintuitive. I will not purchase this game. These games are, sorry, uh, the original game was not a children's game. Sure, they were appropriate for everyone, but they were not designed specifically to appeal to eight-year-olds and exclude adults. This is the worst game ever, and the sales will reflect that. I think that's got to be Wind Waker. I think, on. That, I think that one's Wind Waker, too. That, yeah, I would say so, too. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go something else. Oh, it's Wind Waker! Oh, dang it. <laughs> Ryan H. didn't like that game. Not one bit. Okay, we just got a couple more, and we're almost we're on the home stretch here. Are you ready? Blank's yeah. charming aquatic world is always soft in motion. A good-looking journey comes with repetitive and shallow gameplay, and its pursuit of affecting emotions remains halfway. Still, the execution is detailed and captivating, it's definitely worth a dive. One of the best exploration games out there. It's Abzu. It's got to be Abzu. I'm going to say different. I'm going to say different because he says it's worth a dive. He also says I journey. I think that's a, that's a... Yeah, something else. Something else. It's Abzu! You nailed it! Yes! <laughs> oh, nice, Dean! <laughs> All right, we got one more. All right? Incredible. All you people talk about are cartoon graphics, but once I played through the game, I couldn't imagine anything else. Tell me what game where you can sail stormy seas, fight gigantic creatures with the depths of the ocean, and watch clouds form and move in the sky. The game is truly a dream. No, this game doesn't have the depth like other games, but I love its courage to explore and actually include defined NPCs. That sounds, that like, sounds Wind like Wind Waker, yeah. yeah. 
Guess to say Wind Waker, Josh. What are you thinking? I'll say Wind Waker on that one. Dean. It sounds too close to Wind Waker to be Wind Waker. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to say something else. Oh. It's Wind Waker! Oh. Yay! <laughs> That's the game. There you go, guys. That's my gift to you guys. Nice. I brought to the party. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, All right. All right. So that's Wind Waker. We did talk about some of the differences between uh, the GameCube and the Wii U version, right? I think we talked about all the major ones. And um, oh, one big one that I saw was that the Dean, did you have trouble? And you probably didn't because you are Dean. But <laughs> the when you had to get the forest water and revive all the trees, on the different islands did you have trouble getting through that especially because you didn't have fast sail i i didn't do it i think i had a there was a time limit on it right yes you only yeah. had 20 minutes and the hd version has 30 minutes oh, okay and hd gets a, everything and the fast sale yeah. okay yeah, yeah. And the fast <laughs> sale yeah even no, i, I got it the first i time. didn't do it okay what does that give you because you have to go to like every korok in in yeah, there's like eight of them. There's like eight of them, and some of them you got to go through a little mini dungeon, and yeah, I don't know. I, heart I think you piece? got heart piece. Yeah, heart piece. You know. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, so, I didn't do it either. I, I skipped it. Ooh. I did it the first time I played. I did not do it a yeah. second because I was yeah, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I can, I can see that was that was one of the points I was watching Eric. I was watching you stream. I was yeah. watching you do that. And I was waiting for it to come up in my quest, but I either I didn't talk to the right person or I didn't go to the right area. But I, I never that quest never even popped for me. So mm-hmm. okay, I, I saw all those Deku trees everywhere. I tried yeah. dumping water on them once or twice, but I left it at that. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you well, balk at the eight Koroks, but I'm sure you did the nine hundred Koroks in Breath of the Wild. Eh? Oh, not quite, not quite, <laughs> not quite. No. Oh, gosh, yeah, I've heard about that. I have too. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so um, the one other thing that we got some information from the community was whether this was the best Zelda game on the GameCube. Um, you know, there's Wind Waker, there's Four uh, Four Swords Adventures, and Twilight Princess. Um, have you guys played any of the others? Can you compare? Like for me, I like I said, Wind Waker was my first Zelda, and it's been my only Zelda. So for me, I don't know, and I've actually been thinking about playing another Zelda. I just wasn't sure which one I wanted to jump into next. We'll talk. Breath, yeah, breath okay. of the Wild. Breath of the Wild. Breath of the wild. <laughs> yeah, I'm leaning towards playing that's that what, one that's next. That's what yeah. Eric said, too, yeah. Uh, so what did the community say? What's the, the so favorite? Their favorite is Wind Waker. 53%, is that what that says? My old 53% eyes can't read that. with yes. 41% Twilight, Twilight Princess. Princess. No, and only boo. six. <laughs> only six, like, four But four swords, swords I, you know, I don't know. That's... That's isn't that just a remake of Link to the Past? With no, Four, four Swords was a, a game where you needed four game uh, Game Boy Advance Link cables for people uh-huh. to play, and it was like it was like a multiplayer party game. It's very good. It's fantastic, but you needed four Game Boy Advances. Yeah, four Game Boy Link cables to play that game, and it was just it, the the barrier to entry is so intensely high. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I will say that of all the games on the GameCube, uh, Wind Waker is the only Zelda game I've played. But of Twilight and Four Swords, uh, Four Swords is the one I'm I'm actively more looking forward to playing. Um, I have four Game Boys. I have four Link Cables. I have it all set up and ready to go. Uh, and as soon as I had it all ready to go, uh, unfortunately, our world was hit with oh, uh, no. something <laughs> happened. So I've been stuck with all this equipment sitting around and I've no one to play it with yet so hopefully it's that and final fantasy crystal chronicles that's the two the two yes. games yeah. i had i have i've played crystal chronicles that's only three player mm-hmm. um and we i had the three but i didn't have the the fourth link cable at the time um but now i have four so <laughs> yeah. all right dean what do, what do you uh, say? Have you played the others? I haven't played the others. No, just just Wind Waker. I think I'll move on to to Twilight Princess next. One one thing I, I found really interesting, and I forgot to mention back when we were talking about the story. Mm-hmm. Um, you you know the the game has a lot of allusions to Ocarina of Time, mm-hmm. and it's it, I haven't played a lot of Zelda games, but they've always sort of felt like isolated experiences, and this is really like the first time that continuity from another game 
uh, that I've experienced, that continuity from another game has sort of trickled into uh, this game. Even though they're very disparate art styles, you go to, um, you know, Hyrule Castle, you see uh, Zelda, you see the paintings on the walls, you see Hyrule from Ocarina of Time. Um, and there's there's a lot of, uh, you know, the discussions about the Zora becoming the uh, Rito. What, mm-hmm. what are the flying yeah, Ritos? Rito, Rito, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the Zora became those. And, uh, you know, Hyrule is actually underwater. And it, it just sort of added that sort of cohesive element that I hadn't experienced in a previous Zelda game. And I'm really curious. I, I do have Hyrule's story. I haven't read through it all. But uh, I know there are some some actual continuity timelines that sort of branch off and i'd be really curious to see what sort of chronology i should play to sort of follow that through um (laughs) i I just found it kind of interesting so as soon as i finished this game i looked up i haven't cracked the c i mean i've never looked at hyrule historia but i haven't and as soon as i finished this game i cracked open hyrule historia to check out the timelines because I was curious about that exact same thing. And we don't need to get into it too deeply, but <laughs> I, I will summarize a few things, and maybe maybe John has some things to say about it. Ocarina of Time is a, and this is one of the reasons I felt, not only from a gameplay perspective and its release, but it turns out that Ocarina of Time is somewhat of a pivotal game in the timelines. And you're absolutely right. The timelines have fractured around the events of Ocarina, I think it's fair to say. And there are multiple timelines that sp- spawn from that. And... Wind Waker is one of them, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, there are no games on that timeline between Ocarina and and Wind Waker. There are some that follow it um, that maybe are obvious because they look like Wind Waker, and I guess I'm referring to the DS games. Um, but I, I don't know how we want to get into this, but I'll, 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 lay, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there as... Uh, Hyrule Historia does document some of these things. Ocarina is a predecessor to Wind Waker, um, and there are multiple timelines, and uh, it's pretty interesting. And it's interesting to me because I was I thought that when Wind Waker came out, they hadn't really settled on these timelines, and it wasn't until they were doing Hyrule Historia that they kind of, if you'll forgive my phrasing, uh, hacked together a timeline that made sense based on what they had already done. Um, but but yeah, I, it's interesting, and I would say anybody who's really curious about it, go ahead and look in Hyrule Historia because I think it will uh, explain some things. So yeah. I'm a Zelda, no, Zelda newbie. So John, do you have any the, other? The comments? timeline is a mess. Um, I don't think anybody should ever fixate on the timeline in general. Um, and Wind Waker is the one that really made people be like, maybe it's all connected, and there is a timeline. <laughs> and <laughs> Nintendo had no intention of there being one, and they put that together because fans. That's all they could ever talk about now. That's the thing that all they do is like, well, what, what, when does this take place? What, what, what point does this? And it's like, no, they're telling self-contained stories, just like like a legend changing over time. Like, uh, But the Hyrule Historia is great for art and great for kind of the what if, you know? It, it kind of is a nice little, it's very fun. I have it as well. It's really great. Um, but don't don't run the timeline game. It's a, it is a mess to try to do. <laughs> And it is not an enjoyable experience. You're just like, I'm so confused. I don't know what they're talking about. Oh, so now there's two timelines where it's Kid Link from Ocarina and Adult Link from Ocarina. What if they went off and did two different things? And, oh, well, that branches off into these five other things. And what happens if he failed in this situation? Then that would be this game. And what if he succeeds, though? Then it's this one. Like, that's right. No. Yes. Right. Well, no, that's good to know. Because that, that, that would probably be the only other influence of, of the next game I play. So I think I'll yeah. stick with uh, chronologically as, as a release. Yeah. order rather than trying the, to follow timelines but like you said like the the nomenclature legend of zelda sort of mm-hmm. indicates that it's it's a story that can be told an infinite number of ways and that's just what you're playing is just a different rendition of that same tale yeah. so it was interesting to see the tie-in sort of almost um you know explicitly exhibited in the game yeah um, there will be so- there will be nods to other games and there is in all of them there was always these little nods and, and hints to to something else being there but it's not necessary and it's not going to give you any revelations that are going to in somehow enlighten you and your experience looking back at the previous games or looking forward into future games. It doesn't do any of those things, but it's it's fun to 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 piece those things together for some people, but it's not necessary, not even slightly. It's a mess. So I, I do want to mention one thing about this, and I am again a Zelda lore newbie. 
and I don't remember Link to the Past very well, um, but I played Ocarina last year, and I played this one, and it seems to me that there there's a... Maybe this is stating the obvious. There is a Triforce. There are three components to it. The power, the wisdom, and the courage. And we have our three main characters in every game. Ganon, Zelda, and Link. And they each are always tied to a specific piece of the Triforce. And so really... These games are about our three characters and Ganon and Zelda and Link. And really, if you asked me after playing this game, these games should be called The Legend of Zelda, Ganon, and Link. Because yep. they're all three. <laughs> they're, it's a try. It's a it's mm-hmm. the three of them. They're it's the Triforce, three. right? It's the Triforce. Yeah. And I know even going back to the original NES game, that was one of the what are people what's this Triforce? There's only one. You're only getting together the pieces of courage or something. Where are the other two? And I know one of them is mentioned, but one of them isn't even mentioned. But but um that's really what ties these games together, right? Is these three characters, these three pieces of the Triforce. At least that's the way it seems playing these last two games. And I don't know how it'll go from there. You nailed it. You nailed it 100%, and you should expect that going forward, because that's okay. very much what it really is just about, is those three characters and how they work together. How yeah. they're they're intertwined throughout this legend, right? Throughout all these legends, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And okay. uh, can we take a second, though, to talk just about how amazing Ganon is in this game? He is the best Ganon out of all the Zeldas. <laughs> I was going to say, this is my favorite rendition of Ganon that I've pl- have seen or played. He's so emotional, and he has he has great motivation. You feel sorry for him. You feel bad for him about why he did the things that he did. Yeah. You care about it, but you also know that he is a, a horrible human being. He's even like, in, uh, I mean, spoilers for folks, I guess, in the very final fight, he's like, I'm not going to kill you. Like, I'm not yeah. that person. I just want the Triforce so that I can make my people have a beautiful place to live, you know, and restore these things. But he is an evil guy and yeah. but that final confrontation is legitimately one of the best uh, probably the best of all the zeldas um just okay. just how that felt visually and those characters in that way i have to talk about that ending so much because it's so good and i love ganon so much in this i go crazy about it because it's such <laughs> a striking visual like just cinematically they do so great i love it sorry okay no 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 <laughs> So, I mean, now's the time. Okay, yeah. so it's final thoughts time. Right, so. final thoughts. So, um, Josh, you want to tell us any what your overall final thoughts are? So, when I started the game, I think I was feeling a bit like Eric. I wasn't really enjoying it. I think the game really just kind of threw a lot at you and expected you to sort it out as you went. Um, so, I think I just felt really overwhelmed for the yeah. first couple hours um, with... Uh, with you could you could see all this stuff but you just kind of oh i have to remember that i'll have to remember that i'll have to remember that oh, here's a new thing we'll, we'll put this in somewhere and oh, okay remember this and then come back later and uh, it was just a lot and so i think if you can get past that this is my opinion but if i think if you can if you can push through and you can start to sort uh, or sort out like what you need from what you don't need. Uh, not everything is mandatory. You don't have to take all the pictures. You don't have to do the trading quest. You don't have to do the mini games. You don't have to do a lot of the stuff that you you. At first, I felt I had to do. Same with like the sliding puzzle. I sat there for a good hour trying to figure it out, and finally, I just looked at the guide and said, "Oh, you're just gonna get some money. I don't need to do this." I walk yeah. away. I was getting frustrated. I was not enjoying myself walk away right it's not mandatory um there are certain things about the game that uh that annoy me still i i I do like the game uh at some point i i found the movement to be a little bit frustrating uh or link doesn't move where you point him right away right you go you go to push up and he kind of walks forward and then turns so he's kind of walking around a stick right or falls off a chandelier Yes. Yes. Or, yes. <laughs> falls off a chandelier three times. Yeah. All right, go ahead, Josh. Sorry. <laughs> and, and sometimes the game doesn't remind you of 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 mechanics that you need to remember to get through certain areas. In, in terms of uh, of of the chandeliers, uh, I didn't learn that you could climb up and down ropes until the final dungeon. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't know I could jump the boat until pretty much the last bit of the game yeah um you know just little things like that like i could 
it, it holds your hand in some areas. If you go into a room, you, you get an A button, an A prompt, you push it, and then someone comes and tells you, this is what you need to do in this room. And then other times you're just, you're stuck and you have no idea what to do. And I can, I found that to be a little bit frustrating. And, and, and so for those reasons, I think you do need some help. Eric, you had Melissa looking at a guide, but yeah. for me, I had, I just had a guide and I'm not saying rely on it, but have something there to help you when you get stuck. Cause it's going to happen. It's you're, you're not going to know where to go and things like that. Overall, I do like the game. I do think it is one of the better Zelda games that I've played. I wouldn't say it's the best one that I've played, but it's far from the worst game that I've worst Zelda uh, that I've played. Right. Yeah. All right, Dean, uh, why don't you tell us what you think? You know, I, I think despite my, my criticisms, um, it, it's a solid Zelda title and it's a fun game at its heart. I know what it's trying to do and it sounds like in the hd version they they accomplished what they what they set out to do and i'm, I'm super stoked even after especially after listening to you guys um to go give that a try i would say if you're gonna play it definitely do but dedicate you know a solid either two weeks straight or or maybe a month of sort of off and on gaming to to get through it and i would like there's not a lot of sort of spoiler ridden territory in this game there's not a lot of crazy betrayals or, or anything in the, the story arc it's it's pretty standard zelda stuff yeah so i would say just like read through a strategy guide a little bit get familiarized with how the islands are laid out and what sort of things you might be looking for along the way and what sort of mini games will come toward the end of the game and just sort of you know scope out what this this world or what this experience has to offer and then decide what it is you want to concentrate on otherwise like Josh said you you probably are going to get overwhelmed early on and that that sense of discovery is just going to be diminished by just this this overwhelming feeling of you know the the stuff that the hurdles that get in your way so um yeah play the HD version and uh have fun <laughs> John I look those those guys nailed it a hundred percent in both ways. Look, there's no shame in looking at a guide, like to determine is this necessary or is this not, or to tell you like how much work is this? Do I want to invest my time into this? Um, like what do I get out of this? There's nothing wrong with those things as long as you're having fun and having progression and you're you're moving through those stuff. Do it. Uh, but Wind Waker HD is uh, a fairly like it's it's a pretty straightforward game. Very rarely do you have a situation of, I really don't know where to go. Um, and that's more towards the later half of the game when it opens up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, the game is just tons of fun. There is, there's little, you know, little issues here and there. The Triforce hunt isn't very fun still, even in the HD version. Um, and I feel like the boss right before Ganon, Puppet Ganon? Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> worst boss in the world right there. That's the worst boss in yeah. that game. It is not fun. It is it's just so frustrating and stupid. And I can't, I, mm, I used the light arrows and it didn't work and had to use the light arrows, but it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I, I love the game. It's one of the better uh, 3D Zelda games. It's not the best. Absolutely not. It's not my favorite either, but it's still fantastic. It's one of those splitting hair situations. I can see why it would be somebody's favorite easily. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I played... This is the second 3D Zelda game I've played after mm -hmm. Ocarina, and uh, I have my frustrations with it. That's me, though. I always have my frustrations, my little challenges, like falling off a chandelier. The control that Josh mentioned, I seem to run into. The boat. For some reason, I could never stop the boat where I wanted. But um, little frustrations aside, little annoyances, I very much enjoyed this game. Um, I liked the exploration. I thought that was great. I liked all the side quests. I thought those were fun. I loved the dungeons. Uh, the uh, combat was fantastic. Um, I don't think it's my favorite either. The struck, the overall structure of the game is a little weird. I sort of like the Ocarina has more of a symmetry to it, a sort of a, a mathematical uh, uh, symmetry. That's the word uh, to <laughs> it. That it wasn't quite here in, in Wind Waker, but... Um, it sounds to me that I, so I enjoyed the game. Mm -hmm. I had my problems with it, but it's I'm very happy to have played it. And I would, after this discussion, I would think that if anybody had any problems with this game, 
and they had played the GameCube version to give the HD version a try because the sailing and the uh, quality of life improvements are significant and and I think probably will could in many cases change your your outlook of, of this uh, pun intended. Oh, it's outset. Oh, I'm an idiot. Oh, anyway, uh, it's out. This is, there's an island called Outset Island. Outset. Anyway, uh, so I blew that. So we'll edit that out. Um, it might change your outlook on this game just by playing the HD version. Yeah. 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 Very much. I agree with you there. A hundred percent. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I guess that's uh, that's kind of it for uh, our Wind Waker podcast. Woo! All right. Um, this has been the Cartridge Club Game of the Month uh, for April. May's game is a special selection from the Old Ass Retro Gamer. As a donation perk during our charity stream last December, he got to choose our May game, which is Act Razor for the SNES. Or SNES, as some people like to say. I think that's frowned upon. <laughs> no, I, everybody says SNES, and I'm like, you're all crazy. <laughs> <laughs> then in June, we're going to be playing Cuphead. And we get to announce the We're announcing July it. Game of the Month. Do you want to do the honors? Sure. The July Game of the Month will be Super Mario Galaxy oh, for the yes. Wii. And now oh. available on the Switch. Another, um, I think, well, I've, I haven't played it. Yes. But another really, I think, well-received Wii game, so be sure to join us uh, for all of those games mm -hmm. in the next few months. Yes. Um, again, if you'd like to get involved with the club, I'd encourage you to follow us on Twitter at Cartridge Club NA. You can also visit our Discord for all kinds of discussion about past, present, and future games of the month. There's also the Cartridge Club forums at cartridgeclub.org and the Facebook community and group pages. To those of you interested in supporting the club beyond a review on the podcast app of your choice, I'd like to mention that the club is entirely funded by pledges made from members of our community. We are extremely grateful to those supporters. And if you're interested in becoming one of them, please look into how you can do that at patreon.com slash cartridge club. And I just want to thank our guests today. So um, Josh, where can we find you? Uh, first, I want to say thank you for inviting me to the to the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, I <laughs> didn't expect to get an invite for a Zelda game, but I'm very <laughs> glad that I did. Um, uh, I'm Josh. I'm known as Creepleet on uh, Twitter and YouTube. That's Creep1337. It's always great when you got to spell out your username. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, I'm also uh, the host of the Not So Special podcast with my buddy Derek. Uh, we can find that at uh, Not So Special Pod, uh, pretty much anywhere. All right, and Dean, where can we find you? Well, thanks again as well, guys, for, for having me on. Uh, Dean Lasagna, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram at Round Two Gaming. Um, but if you're listening, come say hi in in the Cartridge Club Discord. Like uh, Melissa mentioned, it's it's a really cool community. A lot of friendly, friendly people, and you can chat more than just the game of the month. It's where I go to get my gaming news. It's where I go to chat Star Wars, to chat MCU. There's just a lot of really cool people in there. So things you, things that you collect, Dean. Yeah, yeah. Like if you guys are fellow you... collectors, yeah, I'm tired of talking to myself in there. So just uh, <laughs> come come show me some cool figures. Um, but everybody's welcome. Anybody who's listening, um, it's it's an open community, super, super friendly, and we want you guys to, to join in the conversation, so. Yes. And John, where can we find you? You can find me on Twitter. <clears throat> At Bogus Meat Factor, F A C T O R. I can't add a Y because it's too many characters. Yeah. Uh, and you can find me also on Twitch. I stream four days a week. Um, that's uh, twitch.tv slash Bogus Meat Factory. Uh, and we play a lot of everything new, old, you name it. I play it. I love it. But, and the enthusiasm very much carries over into my streaming. I love games so much and I just love talking about them. So I hope people would come by and uh, chat about their favorite stuff because I love hearing people's perspective. Great. Awesome. All right. Where can we find you, babe? You want me to plug us? Okay. Uh, my name is uh, on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Mighty Q Dog. That's D A W G. And Melissa is at Mrs. Q Dog. And we both host or have a YouTube channel 
called the Mighty Q Dog because that's what I happen to name it. Um, but you can also sometimes find us on the Discord. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. yeah, that's where we are. Again, thank you guys for being on. Uh, we really appreciate it. This I was really excited to do this podcast today. Thank um, you. And you're welcome. And uh, to everyone, we look forward to hearing from you all soon. And thank you for joining us. CC, CC Unite. Unite.